All right, I call the meeting to order in accordance with the open meeting Actually, law. And the board states for the record that this meeting is being recorded by NORCAM and may be recorded by other local media. Could you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, everybody. So we have a few votes to take prior to the joint meeting, which is scheduled in 10 minutes. So um, first order business is on uh, special town meeting. We're going to skip over number three. Um, I, I would like to just comment on number three. After Mr. Gilberto's <laughs> comments, so please. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. So we did have on there a vote relative to an intention to seek town meeting approval to purchase a, the 14 yeah, Concord yeah. Street property. Yeah. I, oh, yeah. okay. How's that better? Oh, wow. Nice Those speakers are on. So we did have a specific agenda item relative to seeking town meeting approval to purchase 14 Concord Street. However, I uh, spoke with town council and he indicated that he felt that the vote to call the special town meeting, which is the next item, would be sufficient for that purpose, as well as the fact that there will be warrant article recommendations voted um, immediately thereafter. I would note, though, that we did receive a letter from Sergio Coviello relative to his interest in acquiring the property, which is what per what has prompted the town to have its um, option for first refusal. Uh, that letter was in the um, the meeting packet, and I, I do know Mr. Coviello is here today with his uh, his attorney. Um, but we've structured this as such to call the town meeting after identifying the date and then make recommendations on the warrant, uh, which will go to the printer as soon as Monday. Okay. I, I, I skipped over that because I didn't have my glasses on, and I can see now that that's what... That's what we're doing. So, um, okay. Any other members have any questions, or are we ready to move on to the next order of business, which is the vote to call a special town meeting and sign the special town meeting warrant? Do we have a vote? Uh, Madam Chair, I move to call a special town meeting for Monday, March 30th, 2020, and to sign the special town meeting warrant. Second. I have a motion, to, and a second by Mr. Schultz. Any discussion? The only thing I can say is that I'm gone on that day. I'm on vacation the 27th through the 4th. And so I, I understand that I'll be, you know, I'll probably be in the minority um, having an opposing view, and I'd be happy to put together a statement so that the meeting can continue on as is. And if someone could read my statement, I'd be happy to have that happen, or I might even consider just flying back for the day just to do the meeting. But. I don't want to stop the world, but I can only make the, personally, I can only make the 25th and the 11th um, dates. The 30th is also bad for me, but I could make it work. But I understand we're limited to the school availability, so. Okay. Again, I have, I have no objection to any of the dates at this point, so. Okay. I don't but what works. Could, could I perhaps just offer some context? So, and I put this slide up here just for the public to understand. Um, we're, we're limited by the 120-day statutory timeline you, required for a 61A project um, acquisition such as this. We're also limited by the town charter, which was, does not allow for a town meeting to be held on a religious holiday. Um, we're also further limited by um, an extended period of religious holidays, multiple holidays in the month of April. The school vacation that takes place, um, I, I believe that it would not be the intention of the, the, the board to set a town meeting on a Sunday. Um, and then the final limitation, unfortunately, uh, is just the availability of the Performing Arts Center um, at a very busy time of year. So that's what has prompted us to have very few options that are available. I've put them on the slide and given them to the board members as well. Uh, I put in parentheses some comments that I got back about other community events that might be going on. Um, uh, during some of the evenings. They wouldn't prohibit us from having the town meeting that night, but I do think that the board you know, certainly should be aware that you know, we've been advised that there are some events going on. We identified the March 30th date as the recommended date based on the fact that there, um, it, it would fall between select board meetings. Um, it, would be, uh, it was an available date based on the criteria I just described, um, and that um, it would allow us to avoid having to go to 
um, have a Friday or Saturday town meeting or waiting until May to have the town meeting, um, which is really creeping up on the deadline and, and you know, for anything unforeseen were to occur, it could complicate things. The challenge with any of the earlier dates is that we have, um, we've structured this so that we can do our due diligence uh, through environmental and um, engineering review of the property. That, that will take some time and we are pushing to have that done so that we have the information as soon as those early dates, but I, I just do need to caution that the timelines are very tight. Like, we send out on the uh, members, printer? Mr. Schultz, you're available. It doesn't matter on any of these. Mr. Walner, what was the date you said you were The weren't? only dates I can make are, you know, right now, the only dates I can make without flying back is the 25th and the 11th. So, bookends. Everything else is in between. Madam around. Chair? Michael, could the printer get, I know there was a discussion right. if we could get the printing out, but could we make the 25th date for the printing purposes? We can. We would need to provide the, um, the warrant to the printer on Monday during the day, which we could do. Um, it would, we had put out a request for uh, any recommendations to be included in the warrant to boards and committees that were interested in offering them. Um, unfortunately, if we were to provide the warrant that day, we would not be able to include th those recommendations and I would advise those committees accordingly if that's the date we go with. It does not preclude any committee or officer from making a recommendation directly on the floor of town meeting though. Which we would, we would want them to do that. Sure. So, Mr. Schultz? O'Leary. No. Um, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> Mr. O'Leary, I'm sorry. Uh, that's all right. It, why don't we just go with Monday, May 11th, and uh, give us plenty of time to get the data back on the environmental surveys and everything else, and see what the chips fall. That way there, nobody's rushed. We do our due diligence, and uh, what does provide us with ample opportunity you? to... Uh, have additional public comment and input. <laughs> input. I guess the moderator can't be there. Is that no, what he, he, he said he, he said, said, he'll he'll said he said he, he it was a he preferred oh, not, but, oh, okay. but can of course not, but can I read the same as I just see the yeah. comma. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I just would caution that we're creeping right up we're within nine right. days of the deadline right. at that point, and that's not to say not to do it, but I just would right. want the board to know that you know we would be on a very tight timeline, and certainly we can attempt to do as much but work if, in advance. But if I, but the thing is, is if uh, if town meeting takes positive action on May 11th, at that point, it's pretty much a vote of the board to move forward, right? I mean, that is my understanding. That, I yes. mean, after that, it's not much action needs to be taken other than a positive vote of this board to move on. We can vote that night. Through the notification, pardon me? We can vote that night at town meeting. Oh, we could. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, so, so as far as, you know, the additional work that needs to be done after a positive town meeting vote, yeah. 24 hours notice, you know, 24, you know, you can do it as Mr. Schultz pointed out, you can do it that night. So it's uh, actually, I won't be here. <clears throat> I won't be on the board. No, but you can be on the, uh, in the audience. And I'll be in the audience. You can help create oh, a crowd, wow. you know, yeah. but uh, okay. I'll be a counter. Yeah. <laughs> Any, anyone else want to weigh on this? We just get it. We just have to pick a date. So and and, and, and I think it's important. Any one of these is fine. I can do either. So pick and I, and I think it's this. important that, uh, you know, all members of the board are available and I think particularly in light of uh, uh, Mr. Waller's position, mm -hmm. you know, I think he should be able to be heard. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the so 25th you, you could do too, right? I can do the 25th or the 11th, yeah. 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 And we have enough time. Mr. Gilberto wouldn't have submitted these dates if we didn't, uh, okay. you know, have enough time. So we can also do March 25th, so. Well, you think it's still gonna be tight to get the results back for the 25th of March? I think the 25th and the 30th we, we will be rushing and, and asking consultants to rush to, to, do, uh, to do so. There's no doubt about that. But um, you know, we, we selected the 30th because weighing the, the rush versus the, the risk of losing the opportunity, um, I just I didn't want to go I didn't want to go near that risk. But if the board is willing to take that risk, you know, at this point, and again, it's a bit of a, the unknown more than anything. I can't cite any specific issue to be concerned about. Um, we would need to be working on a purchase and sale agreement, which would largely mirror that which was um, agreed to between Mr. Coviello and Mr. Megliozzi on the property. Um, we're not really in a position to be able to de deviate that far from it anyway. Right. Um, but we would need to do that work in advance. We couldn't wait till after the town meeting to do that. Um, Mr. Schultz. I would prefer May 11th things. I think it's very important to a lot of voters that we have that the environmental piece done before. I don't think we should take a risk that it's not done before March 25th. I agree. 
Ms. Walla, you're in I agreement. Appreciate the flexibility. Thank you. Ms. Gonzalez. <laughs> appreciate okay. the accommodation. Yeah. So did you so did I you change move to motion? March thirty? So well, let's let's uh let's re let's recall that <laughs> and re let's recall that or right. well that one we're not gonna agree to that motion, right? All in favor? Aye. All opposed, no. no. And now you're going to re make a new motion to make the date May 11th, right? Madam Chair, I move to call a special town meeting for Monday, May 11th, 2020, and to sign the special town meeting warrant. Second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. O'Leary and Mr. Gilberto. So just to, to be clear, the, uh, the warrant was originally drafted as a four-article warrant, two articles relating to the property associated with the turkey farm one article for a special project relative to uh, water treatment at the town line and then a fiscal year 2020 budget amendment we've had further conversation with the water and wastewater working group and because of the timelines associated with those temporary water treatment improvements um, they're going to need to expend funds for that work out of the water department budget as approved at june town meeting so i have spoken with the finance director and the funding mechanism would be to proceed with a transfer within the operating budget rather than a standalone article so that article has been removed. I will also note that the, in the draft warrant, the um, articles are written for the select board to obtain potentially the authority to acquire the property and to also convey the property as well, as well as to appropriate funding for the acquisition and any potential um, work on site, including property cleanup and removal of buildings. And the intention is to include that funding with each of those two articles. I don't have dollar amounts specifically at this point in time with regard to that work. Um, we do know that the uh, agreement between Mr. Coviello and Mr. Magliozzi for 14 Concord Street calls for a uh, sale price of $1.1 million for 14 Concord Street and that there are two separate purchase and sale agreements that appear to be contingent on 14 Concord Street being sold for $450,000 each for 4 and 12 Concord Street. So that just kind of lays out what's on the warrant for everybody. I'm realizing I hadn't said that before we started talking about dates. Thank you. Any other discussion? Yes. Mrs. Gonzalez. Are we going to reprint these, Mike? I'm editing it right now, okay. yes. So I'm not going to, we're not going to sign these. I'm going to wait for the new ones. Correct, which I will print. So we have a motion on, uh, that's been seconded to uh, schedule the town, the special town meeting for Monday, May 11th. Um, and all those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. So now the next order of business is to vote the special <coughs> town meeting warrant article recommendations, <coughs> which as you just heard will be different than that which was in our packet so on the removal of that one correct. warrant so article. So Article 1, are we or not? Um, no, so Mr. O'Leary brings up a point. If the meeting will be on May 11th, we won't be submitting, we won't need to submit the warrant to the printer immediately. So we wanted to take those votes at a, at a future meeting for recommendations in the interest of time. We could okay. do that, including on May 9th. That's fine. So we're, we're going to skip over that one, I guess. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, the next order of business is a vote to authorize the chair to sign the right of entry for 412, um, 412 and 14 Conquer Street. And this is for purposes of entry onto the parcels to do the town's due diligence and, do, and let the town's consultants do all of the necessary testing and inspecting um, on, the, on the parcel. Any, anything else, Mr. Goberto, that you'd want to add to that? And of course, our timeline is. Um, abbreviated so we want to have them be able to do that as soon as possible sure that they are lined up to begin as soon as we um, we grant them the authority to do so um, I've already requested and received approval from the Finance Committee relative to a reserve fund transfer sorry that's the warrant printing <laughs> over there um, so we do have a plan to proceed with that review um, the review from a survey excuse me from an engineering standpoint will be focused upon the um, the wetlands the extent of the wetlands um, and anything that might be um, you know, obstructing the use of the property in the future. Um, and then from an environmental standpoint, it'll be a, a standard 21E type review. Um, there has been some discussion about a survey and whether or not a survey is required. I've talked with town council and a survey is not required for us to acquire this property. But I would note that there is a, a recorded plan on this property, which appears to be extremely accurate showing the buildings on it. 
Um, I did talk with the engineer who would be doing the review of the wetlands, and he, he felt that that plan, which is dated 1991, it's not really that old um, in the scheme of some of the plans we've had to deal with. Um, we felt it wasn't necessary at this point. It may be necessary when the property is you know, being considered for any future use. So. I know that was a concern of the Finance Committee. Ms. Hurlburt. Anything else you want to add to that? or Anything else you want to add to that? All right. Can't hear you. In some of its real estate ventures. You're so soft-spoken, we can't hear you. So, because I'm a delicate creature. <laughs> <laughs> Can you please both speak into the mic? I just didn't know if you wanted to add any input. No, no, I, uh, I, I had actually uh, tried to impress upon the town administrator that uh, in the past when we hadn't really done due diligence as far as a plot plan or whatever was concerned that we'd gotten burned big time and that um, at a minimum I would appreciate it if he checked with uh, council or whomever to make sure that the 1991 uh, plan was adequate. And uh, he got back to me the other day and said that in eyes of town council, or it was. So I'm satisfied with that. Any members have any questions or anything further to add? OK, do I have a motion? <coughs> Madam Chair, I move to authorize the chair to sign the right of entry. Second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. O'Leary. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Okay. So now our next order of business is the joint meeting with the Finance Committee on the Departmental Budget Hearings. Okay, thank Madam Chair, through you, we are passing down the uh, two copies of the warrant to be signed and presented to the constable who has joined us this morning. Thank you, John.
Department of Public Works for the first um, first budget presentation. So we have Thank our director here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Patrick Bauer, Director of Public Works. With me today is Mark Hamill. He's the building superintendent. John Klipfels, our town engineer. Mark Clark is the water superintendent. And Chris Deming is the operations manager. So I'll just jump right into the presentation. First slide there are all the various divisions throughout public works that we're going to touch on today. Um, there's uh, a few changes I think you'll see are consistent with past years and uh, what you would expect in a new budget and there are some that are unique and we'll certainly make sure that we talk about those in depth. Uh, this, this slide is just the, uh, the hierarchy uh, within the department. You'll notice that there are some vacant positions that we're working to fill. There are other vacant uh, positions that we'll be talking about when we discuss uh, the future of water in the water division. And then you'll notice in red highlighted here are three new positions. I think all three were included in last year's presentation, um, but we are, we're hoping to have a, a discussion with uh, you today about those. This slide is sort of the uh, personal services condensed, all the various divisions with their increases and decreases in some, in some cases. Uh, you'll notice that under tree care we have some funding in fiscal year 21. Those are for two new positions that I'm proposing, uh, tree surgeon and tree climber. Uh, that's just a portion of uh, what we'll use to fund them. A portion of those proposed positions will also come out of the stormwater budget, so that's reflected in uh, that 12.3 percent increase in stormwater, and here are the here are the various expense budget budgets condensed. Um, there, you'll notice in tree care, the $41,000 under fiscal year 21 I've highlighted, and I just wanted to point out, make sure I'll, I'll point it out when we get to the slide that that number can be reduced if we do decide that the two new positions uh, are going to work out for us this year. Throughout the budgets, uh, we have various small capital requests. This is them in total. Uh, they are mentioned in each individual slide, but this is uh, just for your reference. And we'll start with the administration budget. We have a reduction in personal services. We have uh, a changeover at the executive uh, assistant and the administrative assistant positions. Uh, you know, one I would. We have a very new person in there, uh, so that, that created a, a bit of a reduction in the overall cost. We do have an increase in the telephone costs, and there was a, um, a misplacement of the funds that I would need in your original budget that you presented. So I originally had all of our telephone funds uh, in the uh, leases line, so we've removed that. And uh, I want to say thank you to the finance director for helping me straighten that out. So there were some increases in the telephone budget that we're going to use for, we're getting some tablets that we're going to use, and those all require a similar service that we have with the telephones. We're going to be using those tablets for, um, for out, work out in the field, coordinating with our GPS, but we're also going to, uh, next winter, we're going to be tracking our salters uh, when we're going out and hopefully developing some efficiencies with that. 
The next is the engineering budget. Uh, we have an increase uh, in the personal services. I've asked for um, an intern. This would be a part-time intern through the summer months. This is, you know, we get somebody from one of the local colleges that can help us out. There's, you know, we've, we've been very active in the paving programs, MS4 drainage programs. We have a, um, some projects that involve, uh, that will require constant construction inspection. So this is a unique or a, a perfect opportunity for us to bring someone in from, from college, give them some, some time and some experience with the municipality and in the construction field and take some of the pressure off John and uh, Steve Letterman, who is our GIS coordinator. <coughs> We've been doing, making a lot of headway in our GIS system. Uh, we're asking for a handheld. You see there's a new handheld here in small capital. We've been going out, uh, Mark Clark and his folks in water have been going out and recording some data in the field. And we're really making a lot of headway in GIS, would like, which I think is great. Uh, we're getting, uh, we're really doing well in that field. I'm very happy with what's going on in that department. Uh, so this, again, the PT, the intern, would uh, help support some of our efforts this summer in, in taking care of that. Okay. There's some incre I've asked for some increased training and education. I think it's important that our GIS person stays uh, up on, you know, this is a, a, an evolving technology like most technologies. I think it's important that he stay up and stay involved in, in the community. And also John uh, Clipfell and I are both professional engineers. There are some continuing education requirements for that. Uh, so I think it's important to keep, to keep up on that. In miscellaneous small capital, the, the ESRI GIS, that's our, you know, those are our annual licensing that are required to keep all the licenses active. And then again, that new handheld GPS unit, which is just simply a handheld unit that's accurate, submeter accuracy, which is good for collecting information on hydrants and gates and drain manholes and all, all those things, utility poles. It, it just, you know, it really helps uh, create a robust GIS system if we can start collecting all of that field data. Moving on to road and street. Uh, these, the repairs and maintenance budget we've asked, as well as the other public work supplies, and again, Chris Deming is here, he can speak to some of that. Really what that, um, the increases are really because of the increase, the number, the amount of work we're doing. We're really, um, with the formal five-year plan, we know that some of these streets aren't coming up in a year or two, so we're attacking some of those streets this past year. Chris and his, uh, and his crews were out on Mount Vernon Street, for example, did quite a bit of work out there. Um, because we know we have the parade, we have various things that go on there, and it's really in terrible shape. So they do a, a wonderful job. Uh, we're just, we're looking at the past few years, we've, we've created, we've done a lot of work. We know that that's gonna be ongoing. We don't see any relief from that for quite a few years, so we're asking for a little bit of additional funds there. You'll see an increase in clothing that would be associated with the two new positions. So if we decide that this isn't the year for those two new positions um, in tree care, that clothing, uh, that two thousand dollars in closing clothing could be eliminated as well. Uh, in small capital, we have thirteen thousand dollars for two new trailers. I have a slide specific to that. These are to upgrade some existing trailers. Um, if you'd like a, to discuss that, if you'd like any further information, I can turn over the mic to Chris for a few minutes. If you have any questions, or very straightforward, it's uh, you know just meeting the need. The larger trail will be used to. to transport the skid steer, which is the bobcat, something you're familiar with, uh, and then the, the, the smaller, less expensive trailer is just to accommodate the increase in the size and the number of um, landscaping equipment that we carry around. So, you know, it's important when we're, for safety's sake, obviously, when we're transporting these things around town that we have safe and equipment, uh, safe and uh, efficient uh, equipment to carry those things around. Snow and ice, very straightforward. Uh, this is $175,000, what we carry every year. Um, we have a history, uh, 2019, 410,000. This year up to 329, and it's, um, you know, it's just consistently, this is the mechanism we use for this budget. In street lights, we, we did speak, both Mark Hamill and I uh, both spoke to our counterparts at uh, Reading Light and talked about any potential increases. They don't see a significant significant increase. There, w there were potentials for increases in the cost to deliver e electricity, which is trucking and appurtenant things that go on in the delivery el of electricity. We also want to have a little bit, some funds available for the additional street lights turned on or additional new street lights that are uh, requested and recommended by the police department or by residents. 
and tree care. So what we've been carrying for professional services in the past is $36,000. What that, that essentially is for us to hire vendors and contractors to come in and do tree work for us. So we'll get a call for a tree that appears unhealthy or is a nuisance to someone. John will go out and make a determination. First, he'll make a determination if the tree is within the public way, so our responsibility. And then based on you know, based the health of the tree, is it obviously in need of uh, removal? Um, if, if it's questionable, we'll get some professional help. But if the tree needs to come down, this is the, this is the line where we hire the contractor to come and take that tree down. With the addition of the two new funds, I mean, I'm sorry, the two new positions, we can significantly reduce that. I would say down at least $20,000. We do want to leave some funding in there because there are trees that are in precarious uh, positions and we need to hire a crane. So obviously we don't have the capability to, to use, the, use the crane. So once or twice a year we may need to have a crane come in to remove a tree. It's a larger project. So even though, even if we did add the new tree positions, we'd still want to keep some funds in, in this account so that we could hire a crane if need be. And then regardless if we have a new, those new positions or not, I would ask for, I am asking for some funding to get some tree care specific safety equipment, chaps, helmets, chainsaws, those type of things. Things specific to tree care that would be appropriate to take out of that fund. And machinery maintenance. We are adding, we're asking for a mechanics position. We had the, um, the long time form and retire this year. We are um, planning on, re you know, obviously filling that position. But I do think it's prudent to add a position um, in, the, in the department. Very, very critical um, to, the, to the, the function of our department as well as the function of the police and fire. In the past year, we've taken on some of the routine maintenance and the day-to-day -day, you know, oil changes and tire care and things like that for the police and fire. It's worked out very well, I think, and I, I would ask you to ask them. I think it's been a very good... Uh, very, very cooperative relationship with those guys. Um, it's worked out well. We'd like to continue that, but I find that when we have two mechanics, it leaves us sort of in the lurch if you have one person go out. This past year we had uh, a retirement that we had, we had been hearing uh, wind of it for several years, so it was sort of the boy who cried wolf, and then suddenly it appears, we have a retirement on our hands, and then we have one uh, remaining mechanic who has to go out for an extended period of time for whatever reason, and we're left in the lurch heading into the, into the winter season. So to me, it's, I, I think it would be prudent to add that position. Uh, in, 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 we certainly have more than enough work uh, in the department to keep all three positions busy. <coughs> we have some increase in funding for repairs and maintenance. Um, it's just the aging fleet, the increase in the number of work, the amount of work we're doing in-house. When you look at past budgets, uh, back to 19 and prior to that, um, you know, that budget has creeped up throughout the years as the fleet grows in size and, and age. Uh, lease and rental is primarily used for welding gases and things of that nature. The guys are doing a lot more work in-house. We have guys with the expertise uh, to do that work. So we're doing some of the welding and repair work in-house work on the, on the loaders and on the one-ton one -ton dump trucks that otherwise would be sent out. So although there's an increase in this line, I think overall is, there's definitely a savings. And then in miscellaneous small capital, we're asking for an additional vehicle lift. We have a large lift in the main bay of the garage, which is used for um, when we have to lift the, the larger vehicles, the six and ten wheelers. Then in the two bays uh, down at the garage that face the, uh, the, tr the, the fuel depot, we have, one, we have one lift, which presents a problem for us when we have a vehicle up in the lift, the tire's off, or we're into some project, and then we have a cruiser come in that needs our immediate attention. You can't necessarily take that down off the lift and remove it. So it would be really, uh, it would be really helpful if we had that additional lift for fifteen thousand dollars. Then we can swing things out and make it so that we're just develop that efficiency in the in the in the department. Cemetery grounds, just a small increase in personal services. Um, the main things here are our small capital requests. You've seen the small cart. Uh, requested in the past and while this looks like a recreational vehicle I assure you it's not this is something that we would use it's very difficult to operate in in and among the the headstones there particularly in the older sections where you can have uh, grades that will collapse so it's a lighter vehicle uh, it'll allow us to do uh, to be more efficient in and around the gravestones work and cleaning up it'll help in our spring and fall cleanups and that may be something that I bring to the select board in the future about um, 
updating our, our requirements in, in the cemetery. The guys do a great job there. We have very few issues, very few concerns from folks who visit the, the cemeteries. Uh, we, do, we would like to upgrade there. I think the main, uh, the main thing that we could do there is some sort of irrigation system, very expensive, very, uh, very, very um, much a capital plan for down the road. But again, getting in and around the, the, the graves and being able to work and do those spring cleanups rather than wheelbarrowing in from the roadway with a wheelbarrow full of loam, we could use this card. I think it would be very helpful. And then the mower is just an upgrade for what we use throughout the year on a daily basis, making sure that we're not losing mowers and then losing those days in between our rain days. Uh, we have very little time uh, where we can lose a day or two while we're waiting for a, a rental or a mower repair. So it's just something we want to keep active for, I, for what I feel is a relatively inexpensive uh, capital request. On to the town buildings. We have just a 2.5% increase in electricity, just to make sure we cover our costs. Repairs and maintenance, we've had a nominal increase. We're finding the number of projects we have are increasing as our mechanical, electrical, plumbing um, systems begin to age at the various buildings. Um, we have some small capital requests here that I think are important. We want to replace the garage door motors at the, at the garage, obviously critical that those are uh, functioning, uh, so A, the doors will go up and down when we need to leave the building and so that they don't come down suddenly. And then um, we'd like to take a look at and, and have the senior center stairs repaired. We'd like to remove the railings, make sure that we um, reinstall those so that they're safe, relatively loose, maybe do some work on, on the, uh, the stairs themselves, make sure they're caught because when that starts to get away from you, they'll start to deteriorate quickly, so we think that's an important uh, project. And then we've had a heck of a time over the last few months with the police department heating and hot water systems. Uh, we're dealing with one furnace in particular that we feel will need to be replaced next year, although we seem to have a handle on it. Um, there are some systems, it's just aging, it's reached the end of its useful life. It's not something that uh, should be overly surprising to us. That unit alone could be in the ten to $12,000. And then we have some, some issues with the hot water system there that we really want to attack rather than constantly repairing or addressing these, we think we need to take a more concerted effort with those and just solve the issue once and for all. We did, so we, yeah, oh thank you. So we had an HVAC um, proposal in there for the library that is funded elsewhere. And we're also, we're looking at, there are a number of projects uh, going back uh, years that, uh, you know, that Julie had started. And Mark's new, Mark's been here for five months. Um, it, so he's getting a handle on, A, the things that come up day to day, but then numerous projects that were ongoing in various states of uh, um, completion. So he's really, we're, we're, we're putting it to him, but, um, so we had a project that was previously funded through a, a, a different capital request that Mark had requested. Um, so we removed that, we're gonna use the funding that was previ previously allotted for it. Stormwater, um, increase in professional, personal services rather. These are, uh, these are the funds that would be made available to those treat positions, uh, the portion that would be allotted to stormwater from those positions. And then professional services, we know that um, John primarily uses the professional services here to address our MS4 requirements. As we get further and further along, those requirements will increase and, and change and we deal with some getting ahead of in concert with our paving programs. We try to get ahead uh, a, a forecast on what the drainage requirements will be two and three years out based on what we know we're gonna be doing in two or three years in our paving projects. So we'll use some of those professional services funds to have our, um, our engineering vendor go out, our engineering contractor go out and take a look at those streets and those locations so that we're well ahead of any drainage requirements that we have out there. In the sanitation fund, we uh, still have another year on our collection and disposal contracts. However, the disposal, our tipping fees do go up per the contract 2.1% this year, so we've added that 2.1%, and then we've asked for uh, some additional funds and supplies. Just in relation to that, Madam Chair, are we uh, in a position to extend our contract with them, or what's, what's forecasted for uh, So it will be... What's their willingness to... 
So we'll, it, and we should, we should be looking at that um, soon, and we can talk about that. So there are a number of different programs we can look at if we wanted to go automated, if we wanted to, to uh, maybe make, I know it's not popular, but if we wanted to make some reductions in the amount of municipal solid waste that we're allowed to put out, mm -hmm. that helps us um, meet the requirements of certain grants and other things that go on. So I am actually going to, and this, and I've been working on this, and I haven't mentioned it to the town administrator yet, but uh, I would like, I would request to come to the select board in the next couple of months to talk about that. Some, um, some efforts that we that we want to initiate to reduce the amount of contamination in our recycling, in particular, because um, we're going to see that in our next contract that all the vendors, all the the, um, the collection vendors are going to be asking for. They're going to be charging us fees for any, any type of contamination. The contamination is largely done by site. It's not an exact science. So we are actually going to go out and take a look at JRM's site. We've already made preparations to go out and take a look at exactly what's done there. Uh, we don't have fees on our contamination yet, but we can expect that likely in our next when we go out to bid next time. So there's quite a bit of uh, moving parts in this, and we want to be careful because we can't expect some increases in future budgets. There's no doubt about it. We've been hearing about um, you know, the problems in the recycling world now for years, and we've been hearing that there's nowhere to go but up, but still it, it continues to go down. So I will be back over, I think, in the next couple of months to talk to the board specifically about uh, recycling, and that will certainly parlay into our future contract discussions. Mrs. Howard? Oh, when's our current contract with JRM expire? We have one more year with them that uh, when we were when we asking for this last uh, extension, we aligned it with the uh, the end of our uh, disposal contract. So we have another year after this. But really, when uh, you can't get started soon enough, especially having discussions here with the select board about how we want to proceed with our future programs and how no, we can. No, I understand that that you can devote your life to working on the contract. That's yeah. not the issue. I would like to know the date when this current one expires. I believe, I don't have it with me, but I believe it is, it would be July, well, at the end of June, June 2021. Right. June 30th, 2021 is when the JRM contract expires. I have a quick question on that. So in our current contract, I don't remember the terms of it. I know we looked at it recently for the one year extension, but was there um, a provision that said they cannot take the recycling if they it's contaminated instead of charging the fee? So that's one of the things. I don't believe there's a provision in there that says they can't. Although, and it's not as a practice. We don't <coughs> want to. We don't want to suddenly start knocking, not picking up people's recyclings. It becomes a compounding problem, and it develops a lack of trust with uh, not only us but with the vendor. What we do need to do, and what I will come to, to speak to you about, speak to the board about, if, if you allow me, uh, is exactly that. Efforts we can make. Um, other communities are doing it. It's sort of a soft landing where we advertise, we have community outreach about the fact that there are things that, there's a lot of contamination that's making it in uh, to these bins that really shouldn't be there. Uh, and in future contracts, they can expect to have to pay additional you know, fees for that or you know, through the taxes or however they end up paying it. So there's a sort of a soft, what I would say a soft landing. We would do some community outreach, some education, maybe come to the board a few times. Then we would go out with um, some volunteers, maybe some staff, and go out and tag the various um, recycle bins that have contamination. Hey, you missed it. An oops, we put an oops tag. This doesn't make it, this doesn't make it. You put a list of things that should be in there and a list of things that shouldn't be in there. So it's not all of a sudden <coughs> or after one meeting we have a, uh, an area where we, we haven't picked up any of the recycling, because I can tell you that is a nightmare. So we really want to educate the public, re-educate the public on what's allowed. We have things available now, but people get into the normal system, and they just there's a lot of things where they just don't, they don't realize what goes in there. So they make the guess. It's plastic, it's going in there. But some of those things don't go in there, and, they, and that's going to result in future contracts and charges back to the community. So what... I think my next conversation will be with the board is exactly that, initiating that program sooner rather than later, educating the public, then going out and tagging recycling, hey, you missed it this time. Take the recycling in, and my proposal would be, again, the soft landing, but also supplement with some of our efforts so that um, it's not affecting the public ad adversely. If there's someone who can't, an elderly person who doesn't want to be lugging back, back and forth, 
um, recycling, then we can help them out. So the idea is not to make it painful to, to residents. The idea is to educate and make sure that in the future we are, uh, we're not receiving any contamination fees. I know this is a topic for you know, us to discuss with you with respect to the RFP, but I would, I would want to make sure that we're you know, identifying what can and can't be done in terms of the, the company that we deal with, the vendor that we deal with. Not necessarily all those efforts we've been doing those all along. And yeah. I think Ed McGrath has been here multiple times to explain things to people and in very educational and mm -hmm. very informative. But I, I know that's a topic for another discussion with the board. But I think we want to have some clarity with respect to what the company that we do business with can and can't do, and particularly avoiding getting those massive bills that they serve because they say it's contaminated and they picked up contaminated right. recycling. They benefited by this with most of the cities and towns all along for years and years and years. Right. So we should have the, the benefit of them saying, well, we won't pick it up, but we're also not going to give them the opportunity to send us a bill for what they say is contaminated. Right. Well, I mean, well, the, the benefit of them not picking up is we won't receive a bill for the contamination, but um, it does create you know, dissent with the public and, and an abundance of calls. But so I'm going to be going out to. Is going to be more significant when the public yeah. is going to have a, an increase? You know, we well, that, can't yeah, that's tax for that, of course. Right. But, but we already tax for services, but we also get a fee for services. So once we start to see one or two of those kind of bills and we realize that, that the fee that we're charging is probably not sufficient to cover it, I think we'll get a bigger outcry from the public on that than contaminated stuff that has to go into their regular Right, that has to anyway. be reorganized, but exactly. That we can talk about that at another sure. time. I did notice, I'm sorry, I noticed hands up. Did anyone else have, are you all set? I'm sorry, I thought I saw something. Hands up. Yeah, I don't have my glasses on again, so. So I'm, I'm gonna be visiting JRM's recycling facility, I believe it's next week. Um, and I'll, when I get back to that, I'll, I'll report to the town administrator, and we'll make arrangements to get on a future agenda, and we can have a discussion specific to this. That's so. great. Any other questions on that? Sanitation topic? Okay. In the vehicle pool, we, uh, we're, we're level funding it. I did look at our resource, which is the U.S. Energy Information Administration, um, and got the anticipated um, per gallon cost for gas and diesel. Um, pretty consistent. We do run the budget with a bit of a buffer in case there are sudden increases due to um, things going on in the world. So I think we're comfortable with level funding that. And then here we are at water. I will um, just go briefly, briefly through this. Mark is here. We're going to have a bit of a discussion here about one of the, one of the increases here is our um, purchase of water from Andover. And we know, that, we know now that with the PFAS issue that has come up recently, we have accelerated our efforts. We're, we're working now to get 100% of our water from Andover uh, a lot more soon, or sooner, a lot sooner than we anticipated, which would mean that we would need to accommodate or we would need to have some additional funding potentially in this, this next budget. So we'll get into that discussion in a second. So Mark put this budget together for, uh, with me. Um, we do have that increase in the purchase of water. This was before, this was prior to the PFAS, and that was just a 2.5% two, two increase, uh, which is the max on um, what the Andover can increase our rate, as well as 2.5% uh, based on, the addition, on some additional usage. He had some you know, uh, minor increases for details and printing, 2.5% you know, across some administrative things as well as um, some other supplies and clothing. I just wanted to speak about the small capital, which is uh, a GPS unit upgrade for $3,000. We have a, a GPS unit, which is a sub-centimeter accurate, so very accurate survey quality um, instrument in the office already that we bought a number of years ago. So I think it's probably about $10,000 if I had to guess. Uh, it, it's overdue for some software upgrades and some, some upgrades that will get it functional. And where we're, we're working on our GIS system, this is something that would be very good for, um, you know, shooting accurate, like bounds and, and property line, things that we would need to have very accurate. Uh, it'd be a shame to leave an instrument on the shelf there 
for the sake of $3,000 not be able to use it. Um, we can definitely put it to use. I think it's well worth the upgrade and the reinvestment in it. And then the infrared paving attachment, I think we saw this last year. This is something where many times, we, it's Murphy's Law, we go out and pave a new street and then within the next couple of months we have a water break and we're out digging into a brand new pavement. An infrared attachment would attach to, the, to our Bobcat would allow us to go out, and this is what we require for contractors who are going to dig in newly paved uh, locations. This goes out and basically heats up the area and makes that patch, creates it, um, returns it to like new condition, and it's not only an aesthetic value, it removes all of the seams that will, you know, tend to let water in, permeate, and begin to significantly deteriorate a brand new roadway. So for $24,000, we think we'd use it frequently enough to justify it. And I think it's very, it's an important part of our ongoing uh, efforts to maintain our roadways. Would that also allow you to do it in the winter months? Sure, we can do it in the winter months, so we can do it throughout rather anywhere there's a patch. Just a, rather than just a regular cold patch or a... Right, so we, so yeah, it would depend on what the, what the exercise there was or what the repair was. If we had a full replacement, a lot of times we want to leave those patches and let them settle through the winter. But if it was something minor, replacing a, a, a gate box or something like that, sure, we could use it in, in that case. So here's a, here's a slide that we put together uh, just explaining what I touched on a little, uh, a little bit about, uh, I have another slide here which talks about the increased um, funding that would be required to switch over 100% to, Ando, to Andover's water and then some potential savings, but uh, we just wanted to explain it again. Um, so I've been before the board recently to talk about PFAS and, and Mark and I, uh, we had the PFAS requirements through DEP were, um, were dropped <coughs> to 20 parts per trillion. We tested the West Philly West Village Water Treatment Plan at that time proactively before, before there was any formal um, reduction in that limit. We went out and we tested that. We found it, it came in at 22.6 parts per trillion. And I want to reiterate parts per trillion. This is a very small amount. Um, so we went out and we retested um, not only the West Village Water Treatment Plant, but also the wells associated, the wells associated with Lakeside lakeside finished water and then some various um, locations throughout town and all of those locations came in below the 20 parts per trillion. The way the regulatory agencies look at it is an average of your testing results. So at the West Village the average of our 22.6 and our 18 comes in slightly above the 20. So we're still above the 20 at this point at West Village. West Village water treatment plant and lakeside are both offline right now. During, the low, during times of low usage, we're able to take all of our water from Andover. This is something we do every year around this time so that we can redevelop our wells, do some, some maintenance on the water treatment plants, um, and, and do various things at those locations. So by coincidence, and luckily enough, we were, off, we were offline now. The testing results in Andover were very favorable. They were around six, five to six parts per trillion. So when we ultimately switch over to Andover, we know we're going to be well below the 20 parts per trillion. So we went out and we tested throughout town. All of the locations were below the 20 parts per trillion. Um, but we know that eventually when we get to our, our seasonal high demand, which comes up in the, in the summertime as you would expect, that um, we would have to, without special, or special uh, permitting, we would know that we would have to return the West Village and we're trying not to do that. We certainly have cooperation from DEP. They don't want us to have to turn that back on. We don't, and we have cooperation from water resources and, and the various um, state agencies where we've had this ongoing effort where we've been working our way through the permitting process to permanently get all of our 100% of our water from Andover anyway. That effort was, you know, out quite a bit. Um, but I think with the cooperation of DEP, we're able to do that, you know, as soon as this, as this summer during our high demand. So we're working now to get the permitting and all of our infrastructure in place we're going to need to, to um, create two chlorination facilities, one on Main Street, North Main Street, where we have our meter right now, and also on Central Street, where we can use some of our existing infrastructure. But what, because we're taking in um, additional water from Andover, we need to chlorinate that so that by the time that water reaches the end of the system, the end of our system, there's still some chlorine uh, left in the system to, to address any bacterial issues that we may have. So we could be 
um, receiving 100% of our water, if all goes according to plan, uh, as early as the spring or summer during our high, our high demand. So Mark had, had done some, some calculations for us um, on what that, would, what that would mean to the budget. So he had, he had calculated at what our rate was and what our anticipated daily rate at 550 million gallons per day would be an increase of 383,000 above what our request is now. However, because our water treatment plants will be offline, we can expect to have some savings. There will be a reduction in chemical costs, reduction in, in the electricity associated with the, the water treatment plants, as well as the heat. We would need to redevelop our wells, or the wells associated with West Village. And then there will be various uh, water treatment plant supplies and maintenance that would be, uh, that would be averted. So the total of all of the anticipated savings for the, re for the um, shutting down of the water treatment plants uh, is estimated at 165,000. So one of the things that Mark uh, in, in the town has talked about is when we made the switch over to Andover, 100% of Andover that, there would be some positions in the water department that would, would no longer be needed. So that would, you know, there's, those positions uh, would uh, come up to about 109,000. I just wanted to, I just want to point out when we talk about a reduction, a reduction in staff makes me, uh, makes me a little bit nervous. Uh, I wasn't here for the initial discussions, and, and I don't want to change the path on that, but I just want to point out that all of the positions in, in public works, whether they be in water or throughout divisions, I used throughout the division, throughout all of the division, particularly in the wintertime when it's all hands on deck. So if, if, if we did find that because of budgetary reasons we did need that 109000 we would certainly make it work, but if we had an opportunity of some flexibility, I would ask that we sort of strategize how we go about doing transitioning out of those positions. Maybe we find a spot for those positions elsewhere. You know, the tree positions uh, come to mind in particular. But I just hate to, to, you know, because of these, because of our plans in water to short staff ourselves elsewhere. So I just wanted to point that out. So the total of all the anticipated estimated savings based on shutting off those water treatment plants and all of the work associated with that is about $275,000. In fiscal year 19, we had some retained earnings of $451,000. Um, and then there's uh, an infrastructure reserve and a Stickney fund. And then we wanted to point out that um, any, uh, as well as any amendments in the fiscal year 2021 that could be done later in the budget process. So that's something to think about. Mr. Sarver. Um, what's the cost of the combined potential savings? So all combined, including the positions, I, I, I tried not to make that too confusing. So we have, not including the positions, the combined savings were about 165000 Right. If we add in the two vacant positions, it's up to two seventy-five. Right, but there's typically a cost involved, particularly if you um, uh, lay off two positions. Okay. They're not like they're positions presently. So there's a savings in benefits, but there's also a cost of eliminating those positions. So that's what I'm trying to find out. Right. Yeah, I, I, again, I would, the, from my perspective, we would look at that 109,000 last as really a last, a last uh, resort because of, the, because of the use of those positions throughout the department. You mean it, it would still be a cost factor in terms of a, using a professional services to bring someone in if you needed them to do something? Or what do you mean by that? What do you mean, what do you mean by there's a cost the, incurred? When somebody's job is eliminated, then you have to pay unemployment. That's a cost. So in order to, to fulfill those roles that we've lost, we would need to use other folks. Right. Um, but, but currently, we have we have two vacant positions. Right. They're funded, but they're vacant, so there wouldn't be any layoff provisions oh, okay. if we don't fill them. Okay. So we have two positions that are currently funded, but vacant. So these in two the current vacant budget. positions are would currently not be filled. vacant, not potentially vacant. Oh, that's what I was So we do have, I'm sorry, I did That's why I didn't understand there. your question. Yeah, okay. There's no one serving those positions right now. That's why there would be no additional cost. So, oops, I'm sorry. But they're funded. Let's see if I can get this working. So, funded on 
We have a water treatment plant operator who is, um, the plan is to move him to the foreman position, which is vacant. And then we have a maintenance craftsman position. So that would leave a water treatment plant operator position vacant and a maintenance craftsman position, which is vacant. So there are vacancies now that would just remain vacant, is the short answer. And they are funded, though? Funded, yes. Yeah. Oh, no, however, if we decide to um, adopt your recommendation on the other tree positions, yeah. um, we would have that are basically shifting responsibilities to it within a division. And as you said, you know, th there's a there's a cross migration of responsibilities throughout the there is the Department of Public exactly. Works. So you're, you're using them across the board anyway. But that's uh, right. Yeah. So. Okay. Would they be qualified to do that? Tree? <coughs> so the, the tree positions that I'm asking for would be tree surgeon and tree climber. So a tree surgeon is typically someone who has, you know, the various expertise and certifications. He's what is uh, what would typically be a foreman in, on a construction crew. So he is someone that would be very experienced. And then a tree climber would be experienced and certified as well. Would have, we'd be looking for someone with uh, tree experience, he wouldn't necessarily need to have the, uh, the experience that a tree surgeon would be. So the surgeon would be like a foreman, someone who's been doing it for 15 years or so. Uh, and we would be completely comfortable with him assessing a tree and safely taking the tree down or doing what needed to be done. Uh, so it would be a tremendous asset to the department. And we could go on about the amount of tree calls we get and, you know, there's a capital program that's proposed specific to trees and sidewalks. So it's, it's something that, um, as well as with the mechanic position, I really think it's a critical component to the future of public works. Questions? Well, I, other than it, you know, again, if we embrace this idea, we're just going to be shifting re current resources, and there would and there's a potential realized savings in the water problem, so to speak, evaporate because we're. We're still going to have those positions filled, but that's okay. Right, from my staffing standpoint, <clears throat> right. I'm comfortable. There would be, it would, you would be, you would have funds from a, a retained, or, I'm sorry, from a, an enterprise fund versus the normal DBW budget. Oh, yeah, okay. And is that funding enough to? Do you feel that's enough to cover those two positions? Yes. Yeah. 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 Mr. Waller? Just a quick question. Is there any coordinated effort between RMLD and what you're trying to do with the trees? Because I would think that they're so similar. And what, what is their responsibility? So their responsibility is for trees that have interactions with the, with the power line. So even if we had experienced uh, folks with the expertise, any tree that's in a wire or it's hung up, we're not supposed to touch. We don't touch. That's, that's, that's their responsibility. So they have contracts. They have people that are dedicated to that. Um, but we will, you know, we would have, you know, you have a large storm with trees all over town. Um, you, you know, you need somebody who's willing to make that assessment. And although our guys do a great job with the tree work already, it just, it, it's, it, I can't tell you how important it is to have somebody who's done this for a long time, knows exactly what he's looking at, can address the different situations that come up. Not only our day-to-day -day tree work that needs to be done, because there's an abundance. And right now it's handled through the engineering department with all of our paving, all of our drainage. It's just, you know, it, at this point in the, in the evolution of the Department of Public Works, this is what is the next piece, in my opinion. I, I don't disagree. <laughs> no, it's really, we, you know, and we have, I have a capital plan specific to um, a work order system that's going to catalog and give us all the analytics. So when I come back to you in future years, I'm going to have, you know, all of the tree calls, what they involve, all the specifics of it. So if that does pass, that's, that's something that uh, we can look forward to. We have a lot of trees. Yeah, it, yeah, it's, it's really, a lot of it, it's surprising to most people. Any other questions? Uh, just a comment on the, on the water uh, department in relation to, first of all, the proactive uh, nature of what took place in uh, relation to the PFAS. I think it's a good thing that we took a proactive uh, position on it, and while you know, we got some results, which we weren't anticipating, uh, but it's good that we found out, and we also good that we also have a resource uh, to supplement our, exactly. our supply, which most com most communities do not have. Uh, but I also want to acknowledge the efforts on the part of uh, the administration, DPW, Mark, and everybody here, uh, in relation to facilitating the FEIR application uh, through the state and facilitating all that, and uh, mm -hmm. Wright Pierce and their efforts of right. stepping up to the plate and facilitating all that. It's it's critical. Um, in our effort to address not just the PFAS, but also uh, 
it's based in transfer agreement right, the transfer. and all the rest. So it's uh, everything's moving forward on the fast track. And uh, again, DEP's cooperation is greatly appreciated. But uh, we need to acknowledge the efforts that have been put in by everybody sitting here and, and our consultants have done a terrific job. So just want to let the opportunity pass without acknowledging right. all of your efforts. It's, Appreciate that. It's been Thank terrific. You. There's no further budget questions. I just have a quick question for you. On your the um, machinery maintenance budget, you mentioned that there was a position that was retiring, and so you wanted to add a new position. But in the paperwork, it, it looks like it's a $38,000 increase in terms of the revised schedule. But what, what would the position call for? So the position that we're adding is would be an entry level, so to speak, in the mechanics office. So we're going to fill that foreman's position with um, with somebody new uh, and then we expect to have some movement from within the department so the new position would be entry level in the mechanic shop so uh, is know. it an even is it even comparable to the position that was retired no so the the one that retired was the foreman the person who retired was the foreman so he was at the top it was only two positions so he would be that position will be filled but the new position will come in below so it wouldn't be a foreman's position um, that's added. It's a you know entry level. But it'll be more, you're, the only increase you're asking for. In other words, is thirty eight thousand. So you're going to be u using some of those, some of that money for the, re the vi retired position to pay for the thirty eight or is that the thirty. No. Nope, so the the performance position is fully funded at that level. So we'll fill it at the level that I it's been funded it. at previously, <laughs> and we'll add a new position below. So all of the funding that we're at, the new funding we're asking for, is specific to the one position that okay. we're adding. Yeah, sorry, I wasn't I see. clear. No, that's all right. I just said that's all. Any other questions, comments, criticisms? <coughs> I guess I, I just I'll just ask because it's my first time doing budget reviews. This, so the overall increase to the department is five percent. Is that what I'm reading right? Do, do I have that correct? I'm looking at these numbers right here. Just DPW, or are you comparing water as well? So, yeah, so I'm just looking at the bottom. What so, you gave so sheet out. through you, Madam Chair. So the, the some so the document that was submitted, the overall increase as requested was approximately 7.63 percent. May have changed slightly with some of the amendments that were distributed at the beginning here. Um, I would stress, though, that that does include water, which is a separate enterprise okay. funded by the ratepayers, and that based on the presentation here, we are likely going to have to amend that budget based on the transition to buying all of our water, which is something we'll bring back to the uh, board uh, to discuss at a future hearing. And just to add on to that, and uh, we were, we, uh, Mr. Schultz and I were there for the capital uh, planning presentation, which I think was phenomenal, too, in terms of projecting you know, having a lot of future projected things that you need to take care of. But also, this is the, the request of the department, of each of these departments, as to everything that they can forecast a need for. It's not necessarily going to be what results, because obviously we have to live within our means and live within our financial capabilities. So a lot of these things have to be determined elsewhere. Um, the capital requests, for example, there'll be okay. there'll be another um, decision made with respect to what, be, of all, you know, in total, all the departments seeking okay, thank you. capital improvement. So if it's not may not necessarily result in this. It would be nice for all of you if it did, but mm -hmm. we have to. This is just one out of multiple. In that, have to be we have to figure out what we can afford. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mr. Gilberto. Madam Chair, so that brings up a great point, which I have been saying at other select board meetings but did not say at the beginning of this hearing, which is what you are reviewing is what was requested by the department. Essentially unedited and unreduced, um, not reduced, to, to be into balance. So if we were to add all of the budget requests that came in from all of the departments up, um, we would not have a balanced budget at this point in time. That's something that we'll be doing over the next probably six weeks or so along with the financial planning team and unfortunately I'm likely to have to come in here and ask to reduce this request in some areas um, um, to something that we can actually afford for next fiscal year so we after do want these we'll get mr. Gilberto's um, budget recommendations and you'll see the diff where these vary and where the differences are the, the t financial teams are working on that 
So we'll see. This is, I, for lack of better terms, in a perfect world. However, if it was a perfect world, you'd probably I'd be asking for multiple more <laughs> positions, you know, if we could afford everything and had sure. extra funding. But so then this is what the departments are saying. We forecast we need this. We, we know we need that kind of equipment. But then it, then it will get reviewed by and come back to us with TA's recommendation after votes of capital planning team and, and others weigh in on it. <coughs> okay, thank oh. you. That helps a lot because I was kind of thinking about the big picture, how that works out. Mr. Schultz? Uh, Michael, what, what do you think the time frame is for your recommendations? It probably won't be until April. Okay. And I would say, it, it, you know, based on the budget hearing schedule and the other business that, that's on our plate collectively, probably that last meeting of April or even the first meeting in May. Okay. It'll be prior to the warrant being signed, <coughs> but not very far in advance. Okay. Thank you. And just for the new members, uh, and he has passed under prior administrations, the administrators, some of them in the past, tried to filter out what some of the department heads were looking for, and a lot of the information wasn't getting to the board or even to the finance committee. So what we done as a matter of practice was basically ask the administration to give the department heads, you know, free will to come in and actually lay out what they forecast their needs to be. And then as we finalize the budget, we prioritize based on available funds. At least we're making a better informed decision yeah. rather than the administration making the decision for the board. The board is prioritizing as it should. So uh, over the last few years, the, the process has been very enlightening, first of all, yes. you know, to have the department heads come in here and tell us what they really need in order to fulfill their uh, responsibilities and what they forecast their needs to be. And then we go on in eyes wide open that we have to uh, you know, pare it down in order to fit the budget. So it's very informative, these sessions. Um, and again, and I think it, it allows, in the past there have been some department heads who were somewhat complaining that they weren't allowed to present their, or forecast what their needs were going to be or articulate what their the needs were going to be um, they're a little bit hindered by doing that. So at this point, it's, it's good. You know, it's a, it's a wonderful process, and we get, to, we get to see it all. Yeah, yeah. appreciate the process. Thank you. Thank and you. To, to add to that too, I think it's important if we have a department head who is saying year after year after year identifying a need that we need to address keep on that. behalf of the town. That it, you know that. That's important for us too to it, you know pay attention to that and yeah. make a way to fund that you know that or make a conscious decision to to move to. To, to address that need right. and that they are the people with the expertise that are we have to rely upon. Correct. So. Is it handleable? One clarification: uh, when we're talking about the uh, vacant positions, they're in the enterprise fund, and the position we're swapping them for the two other positions in BPW. Mm -hmm. and if, my, I'm getting to the yeah. point that the source of funding yes. and one is sort of covered by the enterprise funds where the funding for position outside of the water department is going to be funded by available tax revenues. Uh, Madam Chair. Is that something correct? Madam Chair. Mr. You, so that's not being, what, that is not, is, that is not, is what's being, what, what's being proposed. Um, we are potentially going to see a situation of reducing two positions that are vacant in the water enterprise. There are three new positions that are not in the water enterprise, tax levy funded that are proposed in the tree care budget. I think what the director was trying to say is from a personnel standpoint, at various points during the year, these individuals are all contributing to the overall operation of the DPW. But from a funding standpoint, yes, they are separate funding sources. They cannot just simply be shifted. Oh, they can't. Thank you. That's yeah. Just what I wanted to clarify because yeah, it seems easy to fund a position from the in, from an enterprise fund, mm -hmm. but more concerns when we're funding it from available revenue other available revenues. Thank you. I may have misunderstood you, but I did yeah. hear you say that it was a three position would be partially funded. Through, so one the, of them was, you said, partially funded through water enterprise. So I, I, I think I did hear that. So two new tree positions would be funded through partially through the stormwater budget. Yeah. And so the, the town administrator was correct. When I was talking about the um, shifting, I was talking about staffing levels, not, not any of the yeah, financial fine. implications. So when we're talking about the two water positions, we're talking about savings, not filling those 
those two positions would provide us some savings in the water budget, which is funded by the Enterprise Fund. The addition of the two new tree positions, as well as the mechanic, are funded through, you know, have tax implications. So they're funded elsewhere, not through the Enterprise Fund. So we can't fund. use that funding? No. So the, as far as funding goes and where how those positions are funded, it's completely separate. From a staffing perspective, I didn't understand so that. for meeting the requirements on a day to day basis, particularly in a snowstorm, I wouldn't be, it wouldn't be too detrimental to me if I had those three new positions if I lost the two water positions. So we were talking about two different things. We're talking about staffing levels versus how we finance them. So sorry if there's any confusion about that. Well, the, the way it was presented just in terms of the water budget is yeah. because of the increase, where are we going to effectuate the, the difference? Right. That's, and that's that was why not those were listed out, those two big. That's, that's, how, that's why I think it was presented that way. But OK. Any, is, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Okay. Thank you. Any other? Input questions, comments? And thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, 58 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll speak for well. two minutes. Close in, the <laughs> <laughs> Close in the gap. No, I wouldn't. No, I would. Thank, thank you. Thank you. To the fire chief. To the fire chief. 58 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Starting now. Time, time to beat. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's no. Time to beat. 42, 40, 49. Yeah, there you go. I like that. <laughs> That's an, old, you know, it's an Olympic record and a world record. Would you like to let a slight change to fire department operations? And you'll, we'll note that during the presentation. And underneath is fire and police. Great, thank you. So I'm replacing. Where are we on here? Yes. Fire. Yes. fire is tab 19 on the. 19. Oh, oh, oh. sorry. to present the North Rank Fire Department's fiscal year 2021 budget uh, request presentation. I'm Chief uh, Don Stats. First of all, I just wanted to open with a general budget statement. Uh, the Fire Department is committed to providing the citizens of North Reading with a continued level of excellence for our ambulance, suppression, inspection, and general services that the community is accustomed to receiving. You two are soft spoken like Abby. So, for the members, uh, for the people that are watching, do you mind? Sure. Maybe pull that, yeah, pull that closer to you. Sure. We strive to accomplish this continued level of excellence through a fiscally responsible level of budgeting that is not only transparent and efficient, but delivers value to the community to whom we are accountable. So, just an overview of the past year's calls and what the fire department has been um, responding to. Uh, in calendar year 2019, the North Reading Fire Department responded to a total of 2,567 calls for service, which is a 3.1 percent or 81 responses less than the prior year. Of those calls, the fire department responded to 43 fires, four overheated appliances, 1,440 medical responses. 148 hazardous conditions, 354 service calls, 252 good intent calls, 313 false alarms, 18 weather related calls, and four special incidents. The 1,440 medical aids represent a 6.5% increase over calendar year 18 and resulted in 1,063 transports to local hospitals, which is a 2% increase over the prior year as well. 
Of the 1,063 medical transports, 583 were ALS and 480 were BLS. As you can see over a 10 year span, the number of medical transports have increased by 389 or 36.5%. Total mutual aid calls in calendar year 19 resulted in the North Reading Fire Department providing 251 responses to other communities and receiving aid 101 times. Of those 251 mutual aid responses that North Reading provided, 171 of those resulted in medical transports by our ambulance to local hospitals with the following breakdown of 10 to Andover, 2 to Linfield, 16 to Middleton, 1 to North Andover, 40 to Wilmington, 1 to Woburn, and 100 to Reading. As well as uh, emergency responses, the North Ring Fire Department also conducted 716 inspections, which included smoke detector, occupancy, and life safety, in conjunction with the building, health, and police departments. Of that, we collected a total of $51,215 for those services. So as far as the budget request for fiscal year 21, the fire department is requesting $3,857,884, which is broken down in the following divisions. In the operations division, we're requesting $3,605,707,000, which is a 5.3% incre increase over fiscal year 18, resulting in an addition of $181,282. To further break down this request, the largest changes in the fire department request in the operations division um, is in the personnel category, which we're requesting an additional $125,498, and 85,000 of that is for an additional fire prevention officer's position. 40,000 of this is allocated to funding contractual and personal costs to the union, administrative assistant, and to the fire chief. In the services and supplies uh, division, we're requesting an additional 58,400. 30,900 of it is allocated to new and recurring, reoccurring contracted services, including software renewals for training, policy and procedure, and communications that we currently use. 20,000 of that is allocated for two potential new hires, one for the proposed fire prevention officer uh, backfilling that position, and one for a potential retirement. 12,000 of that is allocated for college programs that we are contract contractually obligated, and that's based on poll of the department and who is anticipating uh, furthering their education. And 5,500 of that is allocated for leasing a bay at 217 uh, rear Main Street to house a reserve engine and free up some additional space on the apparatus floor within the fire department. Is change? Correct. So that was a, a change to the budget that I don't think was reflected uh, initially. So that was modified. In the fire alarm division, we're requesting $39,307, which is a 48% increase. Um, that is basically an additional $6,100 to uh, fund a new portable radio for the new hire. Um, EMS uh, actually has a 0.7% decrease of $1,210, and the request is in for $174,570, which is to uh, our reoccurring expenses with the EMS for services and supplies. In the call department line, we're requesting $36,800, which is uh, a 493% increase, and I don't want to alarm anybody, but that is a $30,000, $30,600 additional request uh, to hire five new call members. And what that would entail is uh, out of those funds would come psychological and physical backgrounds as well as gear. So that's for an additional five call department members. The call department currently has five members and supplements the full-time force. Uh, when they are available. Of the five current members that we have, three are most active due to their immediate availability and full-time work arrangements. 
In the mechanic line in operations, I'm requesting $1,500. Uh, this line is generally unfunded because we handle all of our repair work with a, an in-house mechanic, but this line uh, or request is for uh, scanner upgrade software, which we need to diagnose uh, both police and fire vehicles. So again, the total budget request uh, for the department is $3,857,000, uh, which represent, represents a 6% increase over FY18, uh, or an additional $218,000. So while I am requesting a 6% increase over last year's operating budget, the majority of that increase is due to the request of an additional staff member, which I've already identified. Um, I also believe that it's important to note that this year's request, um, excuse me, the fire department's request uh, in overtime is down about $33,000. So it could help offset some of that cost. So what was the additional cost on the uh by a prevention officer? Uh, total about $85,000. So 65,000 of that would be to backfill a new hire from a recently promoted officer for <laughs> that position. Uh, about $20,000 20, $20, of that would be the uh, difference between a firefighter's pay and an officer's pay. So a total request of 85,000 additional dollars. So now I'd like to talk about the, the fire prevention officer, where that's a, a very new request. Um, you heard me speak about it last year, uh, but I would like to go over that again. So in doing that, I want to review the current organization of the department. Um, the current organization consists of four groups that each consist of one captain and four firefighters that work 24-hour shifts in a one-on, one-off, one-on, five-off schedule. A deputy chief who works Monday through Thursday, 7.30 to 5.30, and every fifth Friday, same hours. An administrative assistant who works Monday through Thursday, 8 o'clock till 4, and Friday, 8 o'clock till 1. And the fire chief who works 8 to 4, Monday through Friday. I thought you were going to say 24-7. <laughs> well, it truly is uh, on paper anyways. So what I would like to propose is this new organizational chart, which includes the fire, uh, fire prevention officer's position. Um, so I'm requesting to add another administrative officer's position during the day who would function primarily as the fire prevention officer. I am requesting this position due to the real need of the department for a designated full-time fire prevention officer due to the amount of responsibilities and duties that are required of this position and of the deputy chief's position. To fully understand this request, I want to look briefly at the responsibilities of the Deputy Chief. The Deputy Chief in the North Reading Fire Department is responsible for the following duties. Supervision of personnel, incident management, policy development, emergency response, daily operational oversight, acting chief when required, training, and fire prevention. Each of these listed responsibilities have further sub-responsibilities or continuing education requirements, but none more than what is required for a fire prevention officer today. Depending on the week, 68 to 80 percent of the deputy chief's workload consists of fire prevention responsibilities. So looking at the fire prevention officer's responsibilities, they're a key component to creating and ensuring a safe community as well as working synergistically with both building and health inspectors as well as the police department. Through comprehensive pre-construction building plan reviews, on-site compliance inspections, and code enforcement. Fire prevention officers are expected to be proficient and responsible for inspections, which we performed 716 this past year, building plan reviews, code enforcement, issuing permits, and continuing education. Educating the public on fire prevention best practices with at-risk at -risk groups, and liaison and maintain good working relationships with building health and the police department to solve and isolate, excuse me, solve isolated community issues and other delegated duties from me or the deputy chief. 
So the need for a full-time separate fire prevention officer in the North Vernon Fire Department and for the town is real and is well past due. This is further reinforced by this statement by the state's fire marshal, which reads, the requirements for a fire prevention officer are ever expanding and more complicated than ever before. In today's world, the fire prevention officer needs to be thoroughly familiar with the fundamentals of firefighting, hazardous materials, fire protection systems, fire inspection principles, mass general laws, mass fire and building codes, and national standards. That is an incredible amount of responsibility and continuing education that one person has to accomplish to be proficient in his job <coughs> and keep the community safe. I can't, I can't overstate that enough. It's a full-time job. Chief, right. Chief, is this, I just want to ask you, just in, I don't mean to interrupt you, but in the sure. org chart, so the, all of the um, groups answer to the deputy chief and the chief and answer to the admin assistant, and would they also be answering to the fire prevention officer too? No, the groups answer to the deputy chief and myself. The admin oh, assistant not, works okay. for us. I must be must misunderstanding this. Right. So the admin works just for you, then? Correct. And the deputy chief, or? Right. Okay. So in the org chart, everything works down. Right. Um, so, so that's, so the fire prevention officer would answer to? The deputy chief and myself. And so in terms of how to fill this, you'd be reaching from the uh, captains or the firefighters? That's, that's correct. That. So there'd be a promotion from within or a, a somebody else that wanted to accept that position and is proficient in that position. Okay. And then we would backfill the, so the vacancy. The vacancy. Okay. Exactly. Is it the equivalent of a captain's uh, salary that you're proposing? Yes, I'm proposing this as a captain's position. Okay. Who would this position answer to, directly to you or to the deputy chief? To the deputy chief and myself. So it'd be really be on the the bot the I don't want to say with the captain. It would be with yeah, the captain. Yeah. Right. yeah, he would be with the captains. The w the reason why he's down or separate from the groups is that it's a day position. So he he would not be in he's the not same. having oversight over people. That's what I was wondering. Correct. Or, or. Correct. He's a separate day officer position that's equal to the cap. That okay. is a captain. Right. Okay. Uh, Chief, what type of I know there's somebody sells a house there's an inspection what are kind of inspections uh, I imagine that's a big component of this job are done on a day-to-day -day basis for the fire department sure obviously smoke detector inspections but you also have occupancy inspections which include uh, pre-building plans review yeah. and that's done in conjunction with uh, the, the building department as well as well as final inspections uh, before they can take occupancy of either a commercial building or a, or a house so the fire prevention officer goes in and makes sure that the fire detection systems are working in an operational per the code. Mrs. Gonzalez? So how has this been being handled as of now? As of right now, the deputy chief is handling that responsibility. Deputy chief's doing that on top of everything else? Correct. Don't but they also go into the school's education? They do, and that's handled by one of our life safety educators. Um, but this is also a key component of that as well. Um, and that ties in the community uh, fire prevention or <coughs> continuing education component as well. And this, this individual would probably work with building on, you know, problem properties, hot boarding, or, you know. Very much so. Anything that has to do with fire prevention, uh, this person or this position would touch, as well as the deputy chief and myself, should it become too large. Mr. Walner? Yeah, just um, so let's say you bring this person on, how is it going to, what area of the deputy chief responsibilities are going to be able to be focused on more that will also bring some sure. benefits? So if you can go back to that slide. Sure. You know, what, what areas will free him up to do more or her? Yep. Basically, what that's going to accomplish for me is help in policy development and oversight of the department. Right now, that is being done primarily by the captains based on the fact that I'm out of the building with, in meetings. Um, 
a lot of the time or during the week. Deputy Chief is out of the building handling fire prevention inspection, uh, inspections and services. A lot of that responsibility falls back on the captains and the individuals on the group to handle, uh, which they do a great job. However, with more time available, the Deputy Chief would be able to help me in policy development and day-to-day -day oversight of the department. Just in relation to the current practices, uh, aren't most of the uh, frontline firefighters actually doing the inspections, though? No, they're not. The captains are doing the inspections for smoke detectors. Okay, so the captains are doing it. Okay. Yeah. And um, would you anticipate that the fire prevention officer would also be responding to incidences, or uh, you know, if an ambulance goes out, the would personnel still be called back if you're going to have one more extra body in the station? So personnel would still be being called back. Um, I don't see how the fire prevention officer would be able to fill that in because due to his responsibilities and not really knowing when those calls happen or what he's going to be responsible for inspecting that day because a lot of inspections happen and aren't scheduled to happen that day. Um, it's kind of hard to say, and, and I wouldn't be comfortable saying that he would be able to backfill a position. If he was there without having to go out that day, would, would, that, would you use that? Right now, I couldn't use that without, without affecting the contract, and I wouldn't yeah. propose to use it that way. The deputy chief does in, conjun in conjunction with the state fire marshal's office. And I think one of the questions I think Mr. O'Leary asked was, would he be responding to incidents during uh, during a fire? Let's say he would be responding to incidents and help be part of that overall management team to help effectively manage uh, a fire in a either accountability role or a safety role. So. Day to day, let's say a medical aid call, I would say no. Definitely during a box alarm or if we had some type of major incident, all department members, I would request all department members to respond, but certainly one that's in an administrative role, and that would be part of his function in responding to those type of calls. Overall incident management, something that's larger scale. Okay. Yeah. I know we disrupt. I disrupted it, so no, that's okay. Thank you. And again, currently, did you did you state or did I hear correctly that uh, the responsibilities of the fire prevention officer, as outlined here, represent approximately sixty percent of the deputy's time currently? Yes. Okay. Excuse me, as far as this fire prevention officer, too, um, would be a union position? Um, yeah, yes, it would. So, therefore, subject to filling of shifts that they're not normally, you know, as the deputy does now? Well, the deputy's shift is, goes unfilled when he takes a vacation. I day. understand, but the deputy also responds and comes back. And, yes. And, and gets a significant amount of overtime. Yes. And so, this would be a similar situation, correct? It, it would be. Yep. In that regard, because I know the overtime budget is the most vexing thing that I think any fire department has with stuff in North Reading, it's, it's, it's high. But I understand this is the nature of the callbacks and everything. Is this position better to be collectively bargained with for? You know, with the work in these issues? I think uh, what Mr. O'Leary said, I, I tend to agree, is, you know, is the callback, is, is this position going to be subject to, are they going to be able to come in on callbacks and like any other firefighter? Or? Yes, at this time, the way it is, they would be. So I think this should, position probably should be collectively bargained for to deal with, because this position isn't really necessarily a callback position per se. It's kind of a standalone position in the department. Should it be subject to those same, because that's the cost that's driving this budget every year is the overtime. How do we, we're just going to be adding to it by adding another body that's going to be able to come back in. No, I certainly understand those concerns, and that's something that if I have support on this and we're going to move forward, I have to sit down with the union and discuss the terms or the responsibilities. I think it's perfect, yeah. Yeah, so that, that would be happening anyways, um, and we could discuss it then. You want to have union buy-in on this position? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's, that's something that goes in, in our, you know, in 
within the fire department without saying, but I wanted to first garner support here and make sure that I could get this position. Any other questions on the fire prevention officer? Okay. So my last slide, and I'm going to be pat pretty well unless I have a lot of questions. Um, so some of you, uh, my last slide revolves the future planning of the fire department. Some of you have heard me speak about increasing the full-time on-duty shift size in the past, and I am again today. I do this out of an increasing concern of our call volume, our on-duty shift strength of five, one of which remains at dispatch, and at times, our limited response of off-duty personnel available on callback. To that end, the complexity of the calls that the fire department has to investigate and solve has increased, resulting often in extended on-scene times as well as the amount of overlapping or simultaneous calls that occur annually, which require either mutual aid from another community or the, necessi excuse me, the necessity to call back off-duty personnel on overtime who may or not, may not be available. Based on these facts, I feel that the time is truly upon us as a community <clears throat> to decide what kind of fire department that the community wants a quasi full-time part-time department or a designated full-time staff that can handle most calls for service autonomously. It is my feeling that we should tra be transitioning away from our current system of calling back off-duty personnel in the hopes that they are available and hire more full-time firefighters to know that we, the fire department, have a dedicated staff on duty at all times to meet the community's needs and demands. Thank you for your time and consideration. Did you project in the budget the addition of <laughs> Yeah, that was my question too. So <laughs> That's where, not included in this. Where is that sheet? Yeah. That, that is not <laughs> included in that. that. And I'm glad that you asked that question because I didn't include it intentionally. This last slide was really and truly meant just as a, a gateway to, to a future discussion involving that. Um, I do have facts and figures for you that I'd be happy to share. and. Um, some short-term projections on what that would what that would entail and cost the town. I think that's important to share. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Because I don't think anybody's uh, sitting here is opposed to uh, considering increase in staffing, uh, but we also have to see the offsets in relation to you know uh, limited limited callback that that may allow for. So, you know, so how much sure would make up. To do it, and what would the additional? It's certainly not going to be a wash. It's going to be a, you know an additional cost, but it, it, what dollar amount? So that yeah, would be I mean, helpful. what's the balance? Yeah. Sure. I mean, the overall cost, the the overall budget of the fire department would increase. There's no question about it. So again, like I said, it wasn't included in my budget request this year. I definitely wanted to leave that last slide as a gateway so that we can have a future discussion revolving the costs through the town administrator, of course. You certainly are not the first chief to come in and propose uh, more manpower. Yeah. But, you know. yeah, I know. I know it's something that you've heard uh, probably. No, no. Annually. It, it, it's again. It, it, it's important for us to weigh it, um, and particularly in light of the fact that if we're not getting the response that we were previously getting, you know, from the current level of manpower that we have, then it's something we need to address. So. That sounds good. Do you have a, a sense of, you know, the percentage of, I mean, we review these on a weekly basis, but we don't really have a sense of what percentage is answering you back for that. Do you have 60% of, of the, I mean, because it looks like the same members are responding to you when, they, when the need be. So that's, that's a difficult question to answer because it basically comes down to the type of call. So box alarms were roughly at... 7.93 members per box alarm. But in saying that, there's some callbacks that we have a great response on and we might have 12 guys back on. There are, there are others where everybody's available with their personal lives and we don't have as great or robust of a callback on. So it's, it's difficult, but the average is that. Any members have any missed one? I'm just going back to the slide you said about the mutual aid, and again, I just don't fully understand it. We've given help, I think, in 251 cases. We've received 101. You know, it, it sounds like we're 
helping more, then maybe we're getting back, but I don't think that's quite the intent of that. How do you, in the big scheme of things, how does that, how do you view that information? Well, uh, you're, you're, you're correct. We are giving more help than we receive. Uh, North Reading is, is well staffed. We have back-to-back -back ambulances, so we can handle two simultaneous calls with our callback personnel. If we don't have that, that's when we reach out to mutual aid as others reach out to us. As you can see, uh, Reading is, is our biggest pers our mutual aid community that we assist, uh, that's medically, and they have one ambulance that they staff, whereas we staff two. Our second ambulance is generally kept in reserve um, for in-town calls, unless there is something major happening in another community, um, or it would be um, irreprehensible for us to not send it. But, so that's how we do but handle I, that. I guess, so on the ambulance, I think that's either a break even or we make money on that. Am I correct when I say that? So, so that's, that's not a, it's not taxing our town by offering that service. Not at all. Okay. So yeah. when we go mutual aid with our ambulance, we bill 100%. We don't split any type of revenue with that community. So we, we recover all those costs. Well, we're getting callbacks that replace the guys that left. So it's not, Say that again. We're, we're, we're paying money for callbacks. We are. Replace the guys that went to Reading. So it's not like we're just, it's not a huge money maker for us. Well, it's it's no different than if it happened in North Reading. I mean, we have the same, that's the same recoup that we right, have. Right, but North Reading, those people pay taxes to us. Reading Correct. Doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, but what I'm saying is we're not, there are, we still recover those costs in, in basically um, taking out expenses and overtime. We still, every transport, we basically recover an additional $468 per Well, I guess what I'm getting as a town twice our size has one ambulance when we have two. There seems to be an inequity there that we're. I, yeah. I mean, it's, yes. That's not I guess the question is should we be work. concerned and is there any way to adjust that over time? Well, we've talked about this. It's pretty clear we're supplementing their, yeah. Yeah. their, okay. their, um, yeah, their EMS and yeah. Yeah. So we're supplementing their operations, right. but at the same <laughs> time, <laughs> right. but the analysis has also showed us that we're recouping all our costs right. and it's not really costing right. us. Okay. I mean, it's neutral, but I'm okay. Yeah. yeah. What, what is paid back from those? I would just have a question, though, on piggybacking on that uh, in terms of the, you have this mutual aid <coughs> transports, and then you were mentioning that um, North Reading had 1,063 total transports. Correct. How many of those are for our, our mutual aid transports? 171. Oh, so see, it's a, it's a minimal number. In, it's a minimal number. Of the total amount Right, of compared to what, what our department is doing for our residents. It's, yes, that's correct. Um, and then another, I had, a, I had another question for you, which I think is, is along those lines. So for our transports, our transports are covered 100%. We usually have that in the paperwork. Our transports are covered 100% by what's being collected back for those, billing for those. And so there's no additional, there's no additional cost attended to the mutual aid transports. No, there are not. It's all covered within what's collected back okay. for it. Um, but in terms of this chart that uh, Mr. Walner mentioned with all of these um, mutual aids, does the callback required for that, is that also covered? Because it looks like It looks like we have a lot of transports related to these calls that you're getting. I, I might be mixing them up, but you have 14, it says 1,440 calls for emergency medical. Yes. It has 1,346, is that is that eliminating the mutual aid ones or? In, in, in terms of your slide here, are those 1,440? Which slide are you referring to, ma'am? Oh. Right, so it's 1440 was within our town, in other words. Yes, I'm sorry. So the 1346 re, um, is referring back to last year's. So that's all I was comparing. Oh, that's last year. Oh, so 1,440 calls okay. total for medical aid calls. Of those, 1,063 were actual transports to hospitals. That's the, a lot the, of. Yeah, yes. the remainder of those, that balance of 1440 were sign offs or refusals or patients that didn't want transport to the hospital. 
So the 1,063 transports, I think you've okay. explained this to us in previous budgets, that would require our personnel to um, go, obviously, take them. And, Correct. And then you call other members back to the department to fill in while those members are gone. That's right? correct. Do and you, that's, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I it, just, do you call them back anyway once it goes out? Or only if you're going to transport? Only if we're going to transport. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Chief, I know one of the problems we've had in the past with a certain percentage of the ambulance going to be not collectible. Do you know what that percentage is these days? So right now we're at, we've collected in calendar year 19, uh, $858,000. That's minus the Comstar fees. Um, when you say not collectible, do you mean? We just don't get paid the bill on, we have the right to, we have the right to Right, right now we're, we're, we're right around 85% collection rate. So when we're, say, so let's say 15, I'm concerned about the, all the calls are ranked. I don't think it's fair to our rank and file to have to go there when it's not, I mean, really it's not mutual in the sense that it's not nowhere near 50-50. I know we're getting, we're billing that, but when we do the analysis on what does it cost, because we, we go to Reading, we transport to Winchester or Lady, wherever they're going. Sure. We're bringing the two guys here, but we're paying our two guys 100% of what their charge is that comes in, and we're only getting really 85% of what we bill the customer in Reading because 15% is going to be uncollectible. Is that factored into these numbers? The it is. The collectability portion of it? <coughs> it is, because I just use the real number of what we've actually well, collected, okay. so not what sure. we've charged or not what's allowed. So this, there's a couple different categories. There's uh, what we bill out or what Comstar bills out, what they're actually allowed to collect on, which is in a separate category, and what then what we collect. What we actually get. Okay. Yeah, so the numbers that I use are what we actually collected. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And the, just in relation to the mutual aid again, to, to clarify, you know, there's 101 that we received. That is that just primarily for uh, ambulance transport? Yeah, the majority because of that. Two ambulances are out. Correct. You know, and what some of them may be mutual aid, there may be a crossover. We're assisting another community. We had to call another one back in. That's correct, right. and that happens. That happens in every community, um, and that's how. That's why the uh, mutual aid system is so robust and works so well. Um, that's why I'm very hesitant to. Uh, limit our response out. You know, these other communities do uh, depend on us, we depend on them. And we want to make sure that they're there for us as we are for them. Mrs. Gonzalez? <coughs> Who responds to us mostly when we are receiving? What town? So, mostly. medically, it just depends on where, what part of the town it's in. So if it's to the west, we generally call Wilmington. It depends what type of call it is. If it's um, an ALS call or a BLS call, um, it just depends on circumstances okay. and if they're available. This mutual aid, though, isn't just for ambulance. It's for any calls. But it's primarily. Primarily it's ambulance, but you are right. There are fire calls in there. Okay. Correct. And that's generally when there's a huge fire, right? You would Correct. So if we, have a, if we have a working fire or above, we're calling in mutual aid. It just uh, just as we respond elsewhere. So For the it's same, not just the same circumstances. Right. But getting down to the bottom line question, no matter what the ambulance service is used for, it's the the cost factor to, to the town does not exceed what we're collecting back for that service. It does not. So it's it's covering it, and then it's. It, uh, then some. A, it, it does. It's generally a net of $447 per, per transport that we, we recover in addition to our costs. Okay. Any, any, oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. For where the mutual aid, where they're helping us. Yes. What's the cost of the town, roughly? We have to, you know how they pay, they bill, is there a cost to the town when we get the mutual aid? No, there is no cost to the town. So if you're, if you're speaking medically, sir, they would bill at 100%, there's no cost sharing, okay. as we bill 100% when we owe mutual aid. Um, fire calls, there is no cost sharing whatsoever, there's no charge to the town, and we don't recover any costs as well. But it's not billed to the town, it's billed to the insurance that's available to cover the cost of the medical care. That's correct. <coughs> All right. And did, was, there, was there anyone else that, on the committee that had questions? Um, did you have another question? Oh, the extra, what did you say, 400 or so? Mm -hmm. Where does that go? Where does that get? 
That's that's uh, in the revolving fund for the enterprise account for the uh, for the ambulance. Oh, for the ambulance. Yes. Mr. Gilberto. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> you always get a lot of questions about this every year. So. But so the chief, you'll, you'll be sharing with us through the administrator additional personnel. Yes, absolutely. Like I said, that was a gateway. I wanted to bring it up here. I wanted to. Uh, make sure that we had a future discussion revolving around it, but I also didn't want to surprise you when I did bring that up. So, <laughs> yes, what the chief, I know we have the union president here. Could you have some discussion with the union before you come back to us? So we want to make sure there's buy-in. I think it's important that you guys start on board with whatever we're trying to do. There will certainly be a discussion with the union um, regarding any kind of manpower increases. I wanted to first make sure that there was support from the board to do that before we. Because my support will be depending upon whether they support it. Okay. Yeah, it's got to be fine from all interested parties right there. I agree. Well, I mean, I, I don't, we, we can add personnel as we deem necessary. No, but necessary we're adding to the callback issue. I mean, that position has to be separate from the callbacks. Otherwise, you just perpetuate the problem that we've had. You look at that over the last seven years. So you're saying the fire, you feel the fire prevention officer should not be part of the callback? Yeah, because there's been a... I, I do, yeah. yeah. The position is solely to do X, Y, and Z. I mean, I don't know. It's a lot of things we got to flush out. But I think the chief should have the say in that, not us. If the chief thinks that that fire prevention should be part of callback just for the facilitation of what they're doing or what they need there, why would we say no to that? Because we got to pay for it. But he's presenting it, right. you know, yeah. as a budgetary item. I just I see some of these salaries where people make as much in overtime as they do in salary. That's got to be addressed. I mean, we can't just keep issue kicking the can down the road for the boards I mean, it's, maybe it's stabbing I don't know what it is. I know it's always an issue with a fire department because of the nature of callbacks and the way the calls come in and so on but some of these are out of control and it needs to be you know I think that I think the important question is is in your budget presentation you're talking about an eighty five thousand dollar salary position are you also increasing the overtime budget to yeah. reflect this Correct. new position and the potential for over time that that position would create or not? Is it in there or not? It is not in there right now. Okay. And for, it's limited in ambulance callbacks, right? So there's only so many people we call back. We call back based on what we send out of town. As far as box alarm and that type of callback, it is not reflected in there. Well, I'm, thinking, well, I'm thinking more of shift coverage because that's where most of the, the costs, well, there's callback, but there's also shift coverage when sure, they are so out. You know, is it going to be captain for captain? Is it going to be? So in that in that regard, there there's no need for additional money spent because his position would not be backfilled by anybody. I know his. But, yeah. But if he's backfilling for someone else, right, at his rate, as opposed to a regular firefighter's rate, sure, there's a delta there. There's a, okay. there's a difference. I just didn't know if that Correct. was factored into the current proposal or not, and what you're saying is not yet. Yeah, so so not yet. Uh, like I said, I wanted to make sure that we had support for it here, and then it can get reflected in the budget. So, thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? 50 Is minutes, impressive. Mr. Gilbert, just it. just a comment. I mean, I think that the chief is trying to highlight that there, you know, that there are issues that he's looking at, issues that we've discussed here in this room in this very type of meeting over the past few years, and that you know the ability to proceed with uh, a plan, it's going to require a discussion with the collective bargaining unit. It's going to have collective bargaining implications, and um, it's no secret that we are headed into bargaining with the union um, uh, for a contract that expires June 30th. So I'm sure there will be a forum for those discussions to be held. Thank you. I'm just saying, we, if we want to add personnel, that's within our de determination, discretion to do that within the budget. But I also think if someone's overtime is high, that's the person that's answering the call. So maybe that's the person that's frequently depended upon and available to the chief to answer the call versus others who may not be earning that who don't answer the call. So mm -hmm. I don't necessarily think it's out of control, although I appreciate the fiscal, you know. You just look at the numbers. And responsibilities. It's, it's yeah, well, that par is we probably the that person phase. that 100% yeah. of the time is answering 100% of the time Maybe. versus 40% of the time. So, you know, you uh, answer the call, you, you, you should be paid for answering yeah. the call. So. And that's accurate because there are 
people that make more overtime than others, and that's because they come back more often than others. They make uh, them not that it's not available. offered out unfairly. It's everybody's given an equal opportunity. It just happens to be where they land and who actually uh, accepts the coverage and who doesn't. And so that would be for that purpose of adding more personnel to assist because maybe we're going to see a shift in that where there'd be less membership. We, we are hearing from him. There is less membership. Maybe the newer members, I don't know who that is. I haven't actually analyzed it. I'm sure the chief is much, much more familiar with it. So now it's shifting now and that he needs more personnel because maybe there are less and less individuals that are going to be responding to Maybe I didn't articulate what I was saying earlier. As far as his new position, we just want to make sure it's not a, a, a position that has a salary of X, and now it's X times 1.5 because of the overtime. Mm -hmm. So that needs to be, that's a budgetary issue. Yes, this board has the right to add whoever they want. I agree mm -hmm. with that. But we don't want to add into a system that somebody could make double their salary in overtime. It, we have no control over that once we add that position. So we have to make sure that particular petition, position is collectively bargaining right. with the union to address those issues, to be fair to everybody involved, including the union. I think it's important. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, comments, questions, anything else? Anybody else have anything? No. You, you did, you, he did it in less than 49 minutes. God bless you. Another Good bench for you, work. and yeah. thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. Gonna, <laughs> thank you, Chief. <laughs> Tell Pat he's no longer the record holder. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, that truck was broken in an hour. <laughs> Yeah, he was a record holder, actually. Yeah, by the way, I just want to add, every time I'm in this room, things go quick. Remember that board meeting I was at? That <laughs> oh, year? you think it's you, huh? You think you're our you lucky child? Well, we no. haven't heard um, from police yet. Why didn't you wait? <laughs> oh, okay. You can take here. You can get the order. Okay. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Just since we're a little ahead of schedule, we're going to take a yeah. quick break, okay? Just a quick recess. We can
to call the meeting back to order. Please join us and want to keep the momentum going. 40 minutes for you. <laughs> you better talk fast. I was told to keep it under three hours, and I will do that. <laughs> Oh, no. More coffee. Take whatever time you need, Chief, because I'm out of here by 10 minutes to 1. <laughs> so welcome. So I won't so need, your, I won't saying, need please, your vote Please then, don't right? be aff offended if I have to get a vote. <laughs> so we're all loaded with caffeine. We're ready for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Trace, you want to wait or start? Oh, yeah. Where's the rest of the, oh, I'm sorry. Is everybody? I don't see anybody in the hallway. We're good. Oh, we're all here. Oh, we'll catch you. Uh, thank you um, to the Select Board and Finance Committee um, for being here today to allow us to present our FY21 budget proposal. I just wanted to introduce the staff I have here today who's going to help me with the presentation. Uh, Drug Free Communities Director Amy Lockowitz. I'm a mental health clinician slash substance abuse clinician, uh, Laura Miranda, Detective Lieutenant Tom Romeo, and Patrol Lieutenant Mark Zimmerman. Um, Kevin Brennan, who um, was scheduled to be here today, has an illness, um, so he's not able to be here. Um, I was going to say in front of the board that Kevin Brennan is planning to retire in July. Um, this would have been his last budget presentation, but last year was his last budget presentation. So. Um, but he's been with the department for over 27 years. Um, he's been uh, in the administrative level as a lieutenant since 2007. And um, he was the, um, he was the last man standing through the last administration and helped us transition to where we are today. So I just want to acknowledge his, um, his um, dedication to the department and um, his loyalty to the, to the community and also his professionalism in transitioning the department from where they were um, 2012 to where we are today. So that being said, um, let me begin the presentation. So as you'll see as we start to go forward, um, this is a pretty, fiscally speaking, pretty straightforward um, budget proposal. We're only asking for an increase of about $29,000. Um, but that doesn't mean that um, it's a straightforward budget because it's important for um, us to explain to you what our goals and objectives are going to be uh, for the upcoming year. Um, I still believe that a budget statement from the police department is the most probably important statement they can make to the public because it transitions our uh, missions and values into goals and objectives so we can support the vision of the, of the select board um, and the community. So some of the things I'm going to be talking about today is uh, we're going to review our goals and objectives that we set last year at this time. I'll give you an idea of um, what our workload indicators are for the past year. I'll go over some of the grants um, that we've been issued through state and um, federal governments. I'll give you our budget statement, which will talk about um, what we're asking for for our upcoming year. I'll give you a little bit of background on um, our request for overtime and expenditures. Uh, we'll also give you a fleet management update, which we do every year. And then I'll talk about our um, FY21 goals and objectives. So going over our goals from um, that we set last year, um, we had a lieutenant and sergeant promotional process. As I explained a couple minutes ago, Lieutenant Brennan is going to be retiring, so there's going to be a transition from um, in that position. So we had to establish a promotional list um, as part of our policies. We did that. Uh, we had a, a um, outside consultant come in and do a written test for a sergeant, um, the exam process, and then we also did a written test for lieutenants, and we also did an assessment center for the lieutenant's position. Both exams um, have given us a list of five personnel in within the department um, that will be eligible for um, consideration for promotion. Uh, we also had a police entrance exam in um, 2000, uh, September of 2019, 95 people took the exam and we have a certified list of 80 um, people to be considered for patrol officer. Uh, when Lieutenant Brennan does um, retire, there'll be a whole process to, to um, fill his position 
then a sergeant's position, and then we will fill the um, patrol position from which um, the promotions have been made. Moving on to, moving on to our specialized training, um, if you remember last year, I presented um, requesting a simulator through the capital um, committee, and it's essentially the simulator is um, a 180 degree um, training module that we will use um, on a daily basis to um, become more proficient in um, not only um, handling situations which involve firearms, but also de-escalation techniques. Um, we have we sent out an RFP back in um, July um, to request proposals. We have received proposals. Um, I've had a, a team within the department analyze the actual specifications and determine which um, which we think will best fit the needs for our department and the community. Um, so the town administrator at this point is going to make a decision um, on the on the financial end of it, and then we he would um, issue the contract to whoever he chooses. <clears throat> the ICAT I keep doing that. Sorry, the ICAT training. Um, so where we've integrated ICAT training, which essentially is, um, I have to give you the, um, the description of it because it's, it's actually coming from the Mass um, Municipal Training Council. So essentially ICAT is Integration, Communication, Assessment, and Tactics, which is a use of force training guide designed to fill a critical gap in training police officers on how to respond to volatile situations, which subjects are behaving erratically often dangerously but do not possess a firearm and we're seeing that more and more often um, we have you know we, we deal with a significant amount of people that have mental health illnesses um, so that they're it's more they don't they, they may pose to us as a danger but in reality um, you know de-escalation techniques again are probably our best option there but this gives our offices a, a, uh, a better understanding um, of, of what the person may be facing, what the person may be thinking. Um, it gives them some tools to now de-escalate that and be able to handle that a little bit um, differently than we have in the past, which you know sometimes is a use of force situation. So we're trying to avoid the use of force situation so that the officer um, is actually more safe and as well as the person that they're dealing with. Um, so we have every year since I've been chief, you know, we're, we're it's no secret that there's obviously a, a, a drug problem throughout the you know the United States. It's not just here in North Reading. It's not just here in Massachusetts. Um, so we continue to work with the district attorney's office um, and our you know local partners as well as um, state and federal partners to try to um, investigate and enforce where we can the drug dealers that were that are actually um, dealing the drugs within our community a part of what we do also is 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 as you could see I introduced both Amy and Laura bo uh, both of them are working um, tirelessly on the um, education part of it and um, referrals to treatment and, and they're going to speak to that in a just a moment uh, but in 2019 we did respond to 10 reported drug overdoses which was uh, uh, almost half um, of what we responded to in 2018 and I feel that you know our change in philosophy is actually making an impact in that situation we did have one deadly um, overdose last year um, we had several other overdoses that occurred in other communities and, and um, you know we've reached out to help those involved in their families we have seen an increase in uh, marijuana overdoses and effects of marijuana, um, not just amongst um, the young um, generation, but even adults. Uh, we've responded to several um, where um, adults have had similar overdoses as, as young, young people. Since 2019, uh, we had uh, approximately 103 citizens use our drug drop kiosk, and we had a total of 340 pounds of unused disposed drugs collected. Um, significant amount. It's it's a little bit up from where it was last year, uh, but this is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. This is about getting, you know, the unused prescriptions <coughs> out of the medicine cabinets um, to reduce the risk of somebody that um, you know to, to take advantage of it or and or 
having a young child get a hold of medicine that, that probably should have been disposed of. So we've had the kiosk in our um, station for probably about eight years. Uh, we continue to see it used daily. Um, it, you know, it's been growing. Um, so we continue to, to educate the public on that as well to try and, um, you know, to um, get the word out there. You know, it's, it's, it's something that we really um, use our social media as well as um, we have um, signs throughout the community to try to encourage that use. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Amy. She's going to talk a little bit about some of the things that um, both um, her and Laura have been working on. Hey, everybody. Um, so I'm not going to walk all of these um, down the list. They're pretty self-explanatory, but I just want to remind everybody we're in year four. Time flies. Uh, year four of year five and our final year of the DFC grant. Um, my position will technically end for federal funding on um, September 30th of 2021. So just um, thinking about that, our plan is to continue um, a reapplication process for a further five years of funding. It's not guaranteed. We have to start from scratch on that. But uh, we are seeing some significant gains and lessons learned in the past four years and how we're going to apply that to our, our following uh, six years now for a reapplication of that year uh, six through ten. So um, one of the things that I just wanted to highlight here is our our growth of volunteers and this is a key element to our success I can't say enough about how hard our volunteers work chaired by Marcy Bailey um, and we have a whole cadre of people that show up every month and then also those people that do off offline work for us whether it be um, sharing our flyers social media work or anything like that I just want to highlight that number up top is that we've grown our coalition if you remember when we first started we had 12 we had to start with 12 and to, to grow to 40 is really um, a compliment to the community's response here. So just telling a little story in pictures here, um, sorry about that. Um, we don't just do this alone, we partner with a lot of the parent associations to bring in public speakers, that's Mark Merrow. Um, he came and talked about positive decision making. We've done a ton of outreach, specifically our number one request has been around vaping and not surprisingly. We've grown that to not just vape of nicotine products, but also vaping of marijuana products as well. And uh, that's Detective Lucci speaking at a teacher event. So we've been invited by the public schools to educate the, um, educate the educators. And we do uh, other professional uh, presentations, not just in the community, but to students. And also we've been presenting at Lowell General Hospital. And we are a regular invite at Merrimack College to the public health team. We celebrated our five-year anniversary, so although we're in year four right now, uh, we did have to uh, start earlier, and we just hit our five-year anniversary, so I just wanted to acknowledge that as well. We had a really, very nice kickoff, uh, our celebration party, and thank, thank you to those of you who came. Laura looks like you <laughs> Laura had a great time. <laughs> <laughs> there, were, there were cupcakes and muffins, I think. There were. Um, this is just my favorite part, and this has been something that's been on my radar for since the day one we got DFC, is we always wanted to have a youth action team. We didn't know what we would call it. We never were able to come up with a great acronym, acronym so we call it YAT. If anybody comes up with a better name, please let me know, because we just can't come up with one. But we do have a very strong uh, group of, small, but strong group of uh, young, young high schoolers. One thing I want to point out, though, is that this is an action team not just for North Reading High School. Um, youth substance use and decision making is not a North Reading High School specific problem. It's a community problem. So we invite any young person who is maybe attending a school not North Reading High School, a private school, whatever it be, to come and join us. And this is great that we were able to kick that off this year. And the last thing I'll point out is that they picked those keywords: think, speak, and act. That's something that the students picked. It's run by. Um, Two special employees we had designated, Matt Costello and Samantha Whitney, both are professional. Um, they are the health teachers at the high school, so very good fit. Just graphically, I wanted to show you about uh, where we've been with trends, and this is actually something I'd, we're collecting our fourth year of data next month, and I would actually love to come back and do a full presentation just on the data and what we've learned. If that's okay with, with uh, the select board, I would love to come back and do a more full presentation on that. Absolutely. Quick question, Amy, yes. if I can. Uh, um, if you could update the public, I know there's a lot of changes in the vaping laws over the last 12 months. Yes. There was a ban, there's not a ban, what's legal, what's not legal. Yes. If you could discuss that, and also what you've seen as far as youth vaping since really it's been more public awareness about the whole subject. Okay, so 
Let me, if I could start with that, about since the new laws have come into effect, what we've seen, um, unfortunately it's all anecdotal, and this is something that we discussed at the State Vape Commission. I was appointed by Representative Jones of the State Vape Commission. We don't have data on that because it's too soon, but what we've seen across all of our communities anecdotally is a reduction in overt use, is how I will describe it. We don't know that actual use is down. I will let you know, um, you know, next month hopefully get a better indicator of that, science-based, but we see anecdotally, uh, access and use down. The state put in several laws related to vaping. I'm going to highlight some of the known ones, but I want to point out a couple of the unknown ones. One of which was the ban of flavored products, tobacco uh, and nicotine products. This has been huge for us because we know that that was a strategy that nicotine industry, and I'm using nicotine industry because it's not just vaping industry, used to target youth. Flavors like bubblegum, chocolate, cupcakes, all of that was used to target and basically hook an entire generation. It was an effective strategy. I'm sorry to say we've lost an entire generation uh, using that strategy. So the, the ban, we're actually- hooked? You mean hooked on nicotine? Hooked on nicotine. Um, that is in effect right now. You can still purchase some until June of this year. You can purchase menthol and mint. After June, menthol and mint will com come off the shelves as well. So basically it only reduces the flavors to what's called tobacco. You might see it sometimes as Virginia tobacco. Um, and we're happy to see that. Unfortunately, that means that, you know, a lot of the black market has risen. Pe kids, I should say kids, but all ages are uh, transporting across our state borders from mostly from New Hampshire in this area. One of the things that came along with that law uh, that I am very in favor of is that if you want to continue to sell, they put a basically a, a maximum on the nicotine content. I'm going to pick on Jewel because it's the most attractive to to uh, youth. Juul typically is a 5% as they advertise, but they came out with a 3%. And what this new law says is that you have to produce a product that is 35 milligrams of nicotine per milliliter or less. Now Juul, their 3% would fall in that category. So the state said, hey manufacturers, every retailer, so let's say Lara's supermarket wants, or Lara's uh, convenience store wants to sell that. Every retailer has to have a letter on file from the manufacturer, not the wholesaler, this is key, saying that it, their product falls in that, that category. Juul, even though they're supposed to be in that category, voluntarily said, uh, we can't do that because we've tested some of those products and they've gone beyond that threshold. Very interesting. Now, Juul is not the sole enemy here or an enemy at all, but uh, we are seeing other products rally and come right up to that threshold so that they can sell in Massachusetts. So that's something that really didn't get much coverage and that's been something that we suspect um, the future violations when our tobacco partners go out and search that, that's gonna be the violation that they can't produce that letter. So it's been very interesting. Does that answer all that? Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, I just wanna highlight that we continue to focus on seven strategies. Although providing information is the most obvious, um, we have found that uh, Changing policies has been the most effective, and we work across all of these. Um, an example of changing consequences I'd like to highlight, though, is something like diversion, where instead of um, being sent home for a three-day suspension for vaping, we'd like to see a diversion program go into effect, and that's something we'll continue to work with the public um, schools on. And as the Chief mentioned, we are kind of unique in this area of using a triad model of prevention, treatment, intervention, and enforcement all being housed in the same same department under the North Reading Police Department. It has been hugely successful for the communication in my opinion and it's something that I get asked from my cohort partners across the country about. What is the benefit and by that's very unusual to move my position in the police department? What is the benefit of having a treatment and intervention specialist in the police department? And that's something we'll continue to look at and advise on. And of course we do this with the community impact team. I'm just going to move the So this is just a review of the last year of this role in town. So I had 178 contacts with community members. That was around mental health issues, substance use issues, fatal, non-fatal overdoses, suicide attempts, suicide completion, homelessness, hoarding, elder affairs, youth affairs. Um, since this meeting last year, I've had 255 more. So whatever that math is, I don't, Liz maybe could do math better than I can, but 178 plus 255 is where we're at right now. 
There were several, and there are still several, community-based trainings. These were in partnership with places like Samaritans, um, Yoga for Families of Addiction, the Senior Center, Youth Services. There is a bi-monthly, still meeting, mental health subcommittee, so it's members of the coalition and members outside of the coalition who meet to work on best practices in the community to try to get outreach to community members on how to get the word out there of spreading mental health services. There is a fat resource binder in my office that is sectioned off by categories. So detoxes, rehabs, um, bereavement support, all kind of filtered based off of the parameters of people's insurance and restrictions of what they can and can't access which led me to a lot of um, referrals. So referrals were made following those contacts, if desired, by the family or individuals to places like the Department of Mental Health, Elliott Homeless Services, um, DCF, rehabs, um, and mental health individual group and individuals and group mental health providers. So, um, just moving on to our performance of workload and in case, um, last year we responded to 19,193 calls, which was an increase of about 1,100 calls per service or a 6% increase over the previous year. Um, reviewing some of the grants that we have, um, our 911 training grant, um, th that's an annual grant that we receive from the state. Um, coupled with the incentive grant as well. Um, that essentially trains all our offices and all the firefighters in um, answering 911, the 911 system. Um, the 911 grants also pay for all the equipment that we have um, within the dispatch center, um, and it does cover some accessory costs as well. Um, they, they covered um, a server for us as well this year. So um, you know, it's been very beneficial to us, but um, uh, they continue to support the, you know, the, all the PSAPs across the state. And uh, we anticipate that we will get these grants on an annual basis. Um, the, the, the last one on this particular slide is just a, a bulletproof best partnership that both the state and the federal government essentially share the cost to outfit our offices um, with their bulletproof vests. And as Amy mentioned earlier, her grant um, is funded um, for this year and next year at $125,000. Um, can't say I'm very confident, but I believe that you know, that based upon the success of, of what she's done, that we stand a good chance to receive this for not an additional five years. Um, so we'll see what happens there. So um, again, as I said earlier, is, is the, you know our budget statement, um, you know, at a budget of just over four million dollars, is, is a very, very important statement that um, we make to the to the public, um, and you know we we look at that as as our guideline um, to make sure that we're effectively policing the department. You know, we, when when we do um, develop this budget, it's it's with the future in mind as well. Um, not only with, with the positions within the department, but where do we see the department in five to ten years? Um, and as you, as you see, um, some of my goals for this year, or our goals for this year, you'll see that we are preparing for the future. So as I said earlier, this budget increase is $29,900, or 0.7% uh, from our last year's appropriated uh, budget. Some of the uh, increases and decreases, and this is not um, inclusive. You know, these are just some of the larger costs that we are seeing. So our, our essentially personnel costs, um, our contractual increases that based upon the contract, um, step increases and, and whatnot, and then our, our rollover time is uh, increased based upon essentially the adjustments. The reason why it is, it is a little bit less, Lieutenant Brennan is leaving, so his salary, um, based upon where he was making, based upon the contract, it's, it's going to be a little bit less for the incoming lieutenant. Um, and then the professional services, that was the um, 
the lieutenant and side of promotional exam, so that cost is not included in this year's budget. And as we'll talk about in our fleet manager report, um, we're only going to be requesting one marked unit, um, so there's a significant in, uh, decrease in the capital request as well. So comparing last year to this year, it essentially was similar to the, um, the prior slide, but it gives you a better idea looking at it um, from an increase and decrease percentage perspective. Our overtime comparison last year um, to this year, we are essentially at $28,919. I wanted to give you an idea of where we were um, from last year. Dating back to 2012, this is still um, less than it was in 2012. This is a more detailed um, overtime request. And you know, I know that the hours and the replacement hours are different. And the reason why you see that is because no, no, sorry. please continue. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the reason why you see that is because our we don't fill hour for hour our our overtime. Uh, we base it on an average, um, depending on the time of day, because there is some overlap in the shifts, and so that's why the replacement hours a little bit. Um, the numbers aren't exactly the same. And our sick time that's on the books. You know, that's a significant increase, but I mean, a significant number, but we, we don't have much use of sick time during the year. So that's why that balance um, pretty much stays and, and grows year after year. So the packet that I had submitted um, has supporting documents for, for not only our, our um, personnel costs, but our overtime requests um, and our expenditures as well. Um, and you have that in your packet. I'm going to turn it over to Lieutenant Romeo to talk a little bit about our fleet management. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So this year, um, as we do every year, we, uh, we analyze the fleet. I, I do it actually on a monthly basis, but for this report, we, we looked at what we think we're going to need in the upcoming year, and we anticipate that uh, one marked unit will suffice, and, uh, and the replacement vehicle uh, would be a non-hybrid version. So as I explained last year, Ford Motor Company is the, the only manufacturer in the U.S. that's producing a hybrid version mm -hmm. police car. That was um, originally designed for a fa last fall uh, target by Ford to get out on the road. There was some delays. There was some uh, issues with uh, the vehicles getting to the dealerships. Ultimately, sometime in January, they started to trickle out to the law enforcement community. My recommendation is not to go with a hybrid this year, to let the bugs work out of the cars and let the end user use them and find out what the faults are so manufacturers can correct those issues and maybe get another manufacturer involved in the hybrid market to maybe lessen the cost. So um, the vehicles did increase significantly in price. And, and last year, we were authorized by the, uh, our budget to buy two marked cars. The chief and I made the decision to go with the 2019s, not the 2020s. But once again, we would have been forced to get hybrids that we probably still wouldn't have on the road right now. So those cars are currently in service, and they went in service, I believe, October and November of this year. So that brought our total fleet miles down dramatically because we obviously replaced two cars, recycled one for administrative use, and uh, disposed of a second. So at any given time frame throughout the year, depending on the cycle of when the new cars come in, <coughs> our fleet averages somewhere between 600 and 800,000 miles spread out through all the whole fleet. When we look at all those numbers and the, and the repair costs and the analysis, we've identified one car that is scheduled to be replaced. It's actually a four-year-old car. It's been in service for four years. It has extremely high idle time on it. Uh, you can see that in the next slide. Excuse me. Um, it's 
It's got 12,000 hours of idle time on it. Um, and there's a calculation that we use. So putting the idle hours into the estimated uh, miles at time of replacement will have about 490,000 miles on it. Sounds like a, a, a crazy number, but um, that's the numbers that Ford actually uses themselves to calculate actual wear and tear on the internal parts of the, of the engine. Uh, we still think the car has a value as an administrative vehicle, and as part of our budget proposal, we have uh, added $4,000 into our uh, request to recycle that car into an administrative use. Uh, <coughs> and with the replacement of the one car, uh, the increase is about $4,000 from the previous year. Um, I, I can tell you next year's budget, we're going to be more than likely requesting two vehicles, and that's been the normal cycle is two vehicles. And they will be hybrids. And when we go with the hybrids, um, the cost is probably going to be $8,000 more per unit. That's not only for the price of the unit, which is about $5,000 more, but it's also the equipment involved with a hybrid, and, the, and there's a body style change, so some of the equipment won't transfer. So is, there is going to be a significant increase. Um, and I think probably next year would be the year that we'd be requesting the hybrids once everything is is uh, worked out with the uh, manufacturers. Just a quick question. Well, quick question, uh, uh, Tom. It, with the hybrids, are there any? I know hybrids don't have the same pep or same performance as a. Well, that's that's actually not the case. Okay, and, I was going to make and sure. And that's what's unique about about what Ford produced. Uh, I actually was fortunate enough to do it a test. T on a test okay. track, I, I was actually able to operate it myself. Okay. And good. the hybrid version is faster than the turbocharged and the gas motor. I know we're not on highways here, but it's, so there's no performance issues with it. No, it's, yeah. it's okay. actually faster. Oh, good. Uh, and it, it has a lot of unique features in it, strictly for law enforcement. Um, but once again, it's, I don't want to say it's an unknown technology. I think it's more of an unknown use when you're talking about a 24 7 vehicle. Second generation is always better to buy. Yeah. That's my feeling. Yeah. So good. Um, Madam Chair, Abby's got a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just have a quick question. I'm not sure car discussions are this use of budget time. Uh, uh, the, um, the, the, the car that you're putting in, um, putting in the service next year has a battery. It's a regular gas. gas. How is it a hybrid? No, we don't currently have a hybrid now, but if we... No, I'm talking about the hybrid. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, 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 it's both. Gas slash battery. Correct. The batteries have, have, do not have an indefinite lifetime. They're very, very expensive to replace. How does that affect uh, the fact, or how is it affected by the fact that you run your cars 24-7 standing out on the street? So when we purchase the, the current cars, and we plan on when we purchase the new hybrids, when we decide to go that route, we buy the extended warranties. So that extended warranty is uh, up to 100,000 miles. So those would be covered under warranty. I think she's saying, when are you gonna, if they're running 24-7, when are you going to charge them? they're running them? forever, can you just switch over to gasoline and you're oh, not, I'm, I'm, yeah. Correct. So, I don't want to get too technical, but Ford has developed, I, don't know, I keep saying Ford, there might be other manufacturers that come on board, but it's, it's called regenerative braking. So the batteries are being charged when you apply the brakes. The cars went from a front wheel drive to a rear wheel drive, but with all, they're both all wheel drive capacity. They've done a lot of different changes. But in answer your questions related to, it's just, it's almost like, if you have auto start in your car now, if you're at a red light, it'll shut down. The, the, the computer knows when the, bat, the engine is not needed. It will come on if the, the AC needs to come on or the heat needs to come on or uh, the electrical draw such that it needs the gas to kick in. But it's gonna significantly, probably 75% of our idle time will disappear with the hybrid. Thank you. Mrs. Gonzalez? No, I was just going to, I think you answered a lot of it. What is the big benefit of, this, of the hybrid compared to a regular car? 
why would you we, want to go that we route? Would, we, well, not only is it a green vehicle, so it's actually environmentally friendly, we would probably see anywhere from three to $5,000 a year in savings in fuel, just in gasoline. So if you amortize that out over the life of the car, three to, three to five years as a patrol vehicle, I mean, you can do the math on right. how much we're going to save in fuel. Okay. You know, it's, it's the unknowns that I'm somewhat concerned about. Um, and that's why I've been hesitant. Right. But I think it's a bright future. I, I, I do think it's the way to go. You'll I mean, have some data by the time you're right and there are other departments that have have complete buying like acton police are, is they're they're anticipating their fleet will be complete hybrid okay. in three years um i don't want to say let them be the guinea pig but i think yeah but let them be <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> any other questions okay I Did we talk about establish honor guard? Oh. So. I'll have to please me. Yeah, yeah. Moving on to our um, applied plan on goals and objectives. Um, that was a few times today, but um, one of our goals and objectives is going to be to identify and train a lieutenant candidate um, to take over when Lieutenant Brennan does retire. Um, there'll also be a trickle-down effect of, of um, hiring a new officer and, and getting him into field training and then training a uh, patrol officer to move into the sergeant's position. Um, one of the other goals that we're, we're, we have been working on but um, we're looking to train with the fire department uh, going forward um, in FY21 is rescue task force training. Um, this training um, has evolved over the years and typically this deals with active killing events and um, historically um, rescue personnel would essentially wait for law enforcement to secure the scene um, and it would be several hours before anyone could actually go in and try to help a victim um, and, and Statistics have shown that that does not save lives, obviously. Um, so what a concept that came out a few years ago was rescue task force training, which essentially would be law enforcement would um, escort um, fire personnel and or EMS into a, uh, essentially a warm zone um, while still looking to neutralize the threat. Um, it, it, we'd, we'd have a higher percentage um, of trying to save lives in, in that particular situation. So we, we did a little bit of training last year here at the town hall um, just with the police department. We used our own members of the police department to be actors in that position. But it's important for us to now transition that into actual training with the fire department because um, you know we, we, we're training on our end, they're training on their end, but now we need to make sure that we integrate that training so that we would be um, have a better chance of being successful if we were ever faced with that. Um, one of the other goals is identifying a fleet manager, fleet manager um, replacement and or transitioning to DPW. Um, Lieutenant Romeo um, is a year or two away from retiring as well and um, it's important for us to, as, as you can see with the knowledge that he has, that we have to identify somebody to be able to take over when he's um, retired um, because there's a lot more, um, certainly a lot more than I know about it and having somebody that actually has um, the knowledge of it but is able to do the research and able to follow up um, to be able to um, to be able to go out and, and make a recommendation with, in the best interest of the community is very important. Um, we have transitioned some of our um, um, the management of the, not so much the management, but actually the repair of the vehicles to the DPW. We still fund all the um, all the equipment and supplies for it, but they have provided the labor for us, and, and it's been working out, and I think we're looking to um, plan with the town administrator, the fire department, and the DPW to now look at um, transitioning to a full-time to the um, DPW um, as far as the, the repair goes. We still bring ours to Ford um, when they're under warranty, but if it's oil changes and um, tire changes and battery changes, we are transitioning to the DPW. 
Um, establishing an honor guard, I know I heard a question about that. So we have uh, essentially, our offices have uh, Class A uniforms, which are essentially we wear during funerals and, and when there is a need to honor um, a particular <coughs> event. But we're not formalized yet. And essentially, this is going to be a no cost to the town. I just wanted to let you know where, where our heads are at with this. It's, it's, it's important for us to represent our community um, during, we, we may see us at, at uh, Veterans Day. Um, and, but the officers just do it. And, and there's no training involved with it. So my goal is to actually establish an honor guard, um, train the officers to, um, to do it essentially by the specs. and be able to represent our department um, in our community at different events across the Commonwealth. Um, you know, we get a lot of requests for honor guards when there's a, a fallen officer or, or a fallen firefighter, um, but we just don't have the capabilities right now to do that. So um, that was essentially a Chief, what do you guys, you guys look sharp on Veterans Day. What do you guys wear <laughs> now? I mean, you guys look great. I mean. it, it, they're class, essentially they're called Class A uniforms. All right. So it, it's just formal wear. Because I wouldn't know you weren't trained because you look like you know what you're doing. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and it's it, you know it's a credit to the guys. They they but they come in and you know they you have to train. You have to yeah. train the movements and you know and is you know looking at Veterans Day, the Marines used to present the colors and and, um, and we do now uh, because you know they're, they're obviously taxed with going to other events as well. So um, you know but the guys want to be proud to do what they do. If we have right. a young guy that they're, they're hesitant to get involved because they're not they haven't had a military background so. Um, this is a good morale booster as well for our guys. You fooled yeah. me. You fooled you. You fooled okay. me. You look good. That's because you're a civilian. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, two other items um, before I, I turn back over to Amy. Um, QPI training. These are just two. I, I try to specialize two trainings. We, we train throughout the year. There's a significant amount of training that we do just to maintain our skills, um, to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the community and what you know the, the challenges that we face. But each and every year we look at something that's a little bit outside that box, and, and, and we want to make sure that we're training in these areas that you know we may anticipate that we may need to utilize that training. QPR is, is one training um, that Laura had brought forward to me um, is essentially it's it's an emergency mental health intervention for suicidal persons. What does uh, QPR stand for? So I was about to say. Oh, uh, I'm no, sorry. that's okay. I'm I'm sorry. Uh, essentially, it stands for a question, persuade, and refer. So the intent is that to identify and interrupt the crisis if needed. Um, you know, if an officer responds to one, uh, a suicidal person, you know. It, Typically, we you know we don't have those skills. We don't have the skills to we do the best we can based upon what we know. But sometimes saying the wrong thing, you know, could could have an adverse reaction with the person. So this training will will give the officers the skills that they need to be able to um, mitigate the situation. Um, you know, and obviously if we can get um, more professional help there, um, that's that's obviously a benefit. Um, but in that short period of time when the officer responds and, and, and it's a one-on-one -on -one situation, um, just providing that to be able to stabilize it a little bit and, and, and then bring in, if, if we have to, a mental health clinician and or um, a negotiator to try to, to uh, mitigate it. Um, the second training is our Blue Courage training. So th this is a new training again um, presented to me by Laura. Um, looking out for the benefit and, and well-being of the actual officer. Um, so this is a, a two-day leadership development for all levels of our organization. And the goal is, is um, to provide our first responders with self-care tools and strategies to support their own well-being while they continue to work and maintain the safety of the community. Obviously, we see a lot of bad things. Um, and you know, the officers, they respond. You know, we, we debrief when, when need be. Um, but you know this this is this is about actually trying to get the officer to realize the times that he needs to help as well um, So we're looking forward to that training as well this particular training We've we've actually applied for a grant through the Department of, of Mental Health. We're hoping um, That we you know get the grant funding um, we'll, we'll see what happens there, but it, you know if not um, I have other funding resources that we could utilize so I'm just going to turn it back over to 
Amy and Laura, so they can talk a little bit about um, their goals for the upcoming year. So the first one is to go off of what Chief Murphy was just describing. I'm working on a training that I'm hoping to loop the fire department in as well on to get both departments trained on their personal mental health care. That could be done both through the Blue Courage training as well as the QPR training. Also working on strengthening the relationship that I have with the North Reading Fire Department by way of either workshops with them or just being more present over in the department so it's not siloed into the police department and that first responders are getting equal use of a position such as this. Increasing community awareness of the mental health and substance abuse clinician role. We have a lot, Amy um, created a spreadsheet of a lot of community-based things that we are planning to do in the spring and there are some more to come in the fall. I'll be otherwise occupied for this summer. We have, uh, let's see, okay so with mental health treatment, there's different levels of care. Inpatient is above a typical kind of once a week therapy appointment if somebody goes inpatient. inpatient. Below inpatient but still above outpatient is partial hospitalization programs. So a goal that I want to work on in the upcoming year is to get myself to different inpatient and partial hospitalization programs to give them information on if they have North Reading residents coming through, how they can access this role once they return to the lower level of care of a community-based setting. Other communities local to here have similar roles such as mine in the police department that I'd like to increase my communication with to make sure that we're all practicing with best practices and collaborating if we have people who kind of flow between towns in a way that is both respectful to the person that we're working with and honoring, like I said, best practices in the mental health field. Okay, so DFC year four. Um, the first goal is actually mandated by the by the grant, as well as the last bullet point. That's that, Those are the two main aims of the DFC grant. Um, I just want to point out that the DFC actually puts vaping in with tobacco. So although we listed five drug drugs separate, um, the federal government recognizes currently vaping and tobacco is one, which we don't really um, think that makes sense for our community. Um, we do, all of the things that we do is based not on a gut feeling, but we base them on logic models and sustainability plans. Obviously with the upcoming uncertainty of if we're going to get funded for year six or ten, we do need to create a sustainability plan so that all of the work that the volunteers and our full-time positions fund uh, don't go if we lose funding from the feds. And we are now um, starting to see more and more support about reaching out to elementary schools, and that is primary prevention at its core. Primary prevention being you prevent the onset of a disease. Uh, secondary prevention is when you prevent the spread of a disease. We are all about that primary prevention. Um, I'm not going to go through this, but I just wanted to give you an example of how we target a substance across multiple strategies. This is an example of one of the things that we did related to alcohol. As you know, you authorized me to do uh, TIPS compliance checks. Our first compliance checks was just completed last week. You'll uh, are, get a report about that. You'll be getting a report about that. Um, and so those are things that we just, uh, it's not just one thing, it's not just about education. And uh, I believe Chief Murphy just spread around our list of spring proposed trainings, education being a very obvious thing. We divide our education into two seasons, spring and fall, where the summer we work mostly with, you know, doing specialized things with, with uh, youth, and the winter we partner mostly with the public school uh, PAs. Again, just to summarize, um, our, our budget proposal is an increase of $29,000 or 0.7%. Um, we believe that what we presented today will allow us to deliver um, the most efficient, effective um, services to the community and be able to accomplish our goals and objectives that we've set, um, that we believe is aligned as well with, with the strategic plan of the, the town. Does anybody have any questions? Questions. Um, I do, and I can't find the slide, but I remember sure. what you said. The numbers uh, calls went up significantly from the previous year, it's and so 
What's driving it? Anything in particular that caused your alarm? No. So, so it's essentially when, when I took over as chief back in 2012, our calls for service were right around 8,000. So um, part of what they do as well, so um, Laura logs all her calls for service. Um, so I don't see it as a significant increase. I don't see it as a, as a bigger impact on any, any of our, you know, what we're doing operationally. Um, I anticipate that we're going to be growing calls for service probably going to be about 6% a year. Somewhat influenced by what they're doing. Yes. That's my contributor. Thank you. Questions? Finance? Yes, uh, Chief. Uh, number one, it's really encouraging to see who's sitting at the table with you and how your efforts at uh, prevention and community wellness might be shaking out. Um, is there any sense for the opioid settlement money perhaps impacting this department or activities, you know, and, and on, on maybe what kind of It's probably, I mean, I, I shouldn't answer for you, but just having a little bit of familiarity with this because the community I work for is involved in that as well. I think it's a long way off in terms years. of, it probably is years and some of them are going bankrupt or entering settlements, you know, while they're going bankrupt that are, you know, that have, I don't think there's anything on the immediate horizon with regard to us getting finances from that yet. But town administrator and I it, um, probably close to nine months ago had um, attended an update um, but the update really didn't give us much direction of what was actually going to happen and I, and I agree it's probably many years away and if we ever see anything out of it I, I'm not sure that, that I went to that as well on behalf of my town and that was to combine um, combine us together as a group that all of the different municipalities and townships that combine us together as a group to give us more settlement ability and the judge did allow that but then has nothing really has firmly resulted from that so. I just wanted to add to um, separate from the opioid uh, income there is proposed, uh, well, when the, with the legalization of marijuana, some of that tax revenue and the, with the modernization of tobacco bill that just significantly increased the, the price of vaping products, some of that tax money is supposed to come back to local communities for the uh, purpose of prevention work. Um, one thing that we're advocating very strongly for is that to qualify for those funds, you have to operate under what's called the SPF, the Strategic Prevention Framework, and we do that. Strategic prevention. No, vaping. 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 <laughs> there is no bacon tax that I know of. <laughs> but I would, yeah, I would have contributed. I'll win. I'll pass that one. Bacon <laughs> paper plate. I'd, I'd be definitely, I'd pass that one. I, I, I did have a question too, but it's non budget related. Are there any more budget questions? Before you, I, it, it's actually on marijuana because you mentioned. Um, marijuana overdose and I know there was a recent case of a fatality a vaping marijuana fatality that. but when you say marijuana overdose all the materials that I've read on, and they're online and they're basically from users say that there is no such thing as a marijuana overdose so I was interested to hear you mention mm. that as part of your presentation what what happens and can that be fatal I know it's definitely fatal from that case from vaping but just if someone is just ingesting marijuana can they overdose on it and what, what was the re what's the response so the, an overdose is essentially it's a reaction it's a, we're getting called and there's medical intervention involved um, I don't know that you could compare it to you know, other other drugs certainly not opiates because opiates is a complete shutdown of your respiratory system um, but we've been ca had calls for services where there's been a reaction and I want to say yes, an abnormal reaction to the drug. And we classify that as an overdose. Okay. Um, because they are transported to the hospital where they would have to have their vitals stabilized. Um, but th there's, there's a whole, so it's not regulated, marijuana. So there's the black market, right? There's the retail market and there's the medical marijuana market. And you don't know what's in the black market. And, um, a lot of people right. feel more comfortable at this point 
um, turning to marijuana that may not necessarily want to go into a store and buy it, so they purchase it on the black market. Um, and, you know, black market's all about profits, right? Not about making sure they deliver a good product. And that, that's where you're going to start to yeah. see that there's going to be other um, substances in that marijuana. Um, so we're seeing that, we also are seeing car crashes. Um, domestic violence incidents, things like that that are associated to that, we're seeing the increase in calls for service for. I just want to um, commend you on the, the QP, I forget the whole. QPR. Yeah. Um, I just, my best friend just lost her son last week, um, battling opioid mental illness for a lot of years. So um, I was actually going to ask you, because I had heard about a program called One Mind Campaign. Have you, had you heard of that? Yes. Is so it we, similar to the QP? <coughs> so the One Mind Campaign, we joined two years ago. Oh, we, you did? We were actually okay. been fully, we've been Great. fully trained. Oh, yeah. okay. So, um, so it, it, it is in a way, you know, it's not the same as Q, QPR. Um, it's a little bit different, um, but it, it's, it's kind of along those same lines. So okay. our, as you know, last couple of years I've, I've come in and presented it. It's, it's you know, it's where we're heading. You know, we're 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 heading to an area where the officers have not been trained in the past in these particular areas and essentially arrested as opposed to trying to get right. help. Right. So where where <coughs> our philosophy is certainly changing. Uh, not that we would arrest for us here. We always, you, you know, the compassion was always there, but we didn't have many options. We didn't right. have anywhere to turn to. In order to get somebody help, sometimes arrest was the best option at that time. Now we have those options available to us. So we, we're actually fully committed to that, and it's, uh, that. it's a nationwide campaign. Um, so um, our office has been trained in, in uh, mental, uh, mental health first aid, as well as they received a 40-hour training, um, each and every officer. So That's great. Yes. Thank you. I, I also, I also want to say, amazing job to all of you for what you do and I just think that the informationals for me are a huge deal all of the events that are held and all of the events that CIT sponsors mm -hmm. and brings and I see them primarily through um, the schools are you know they're they're sending these notifications out to us every day about all of the things that are going on it's just a tremendous job that you're doing and and um, that, you know all of you are doing but I think that that is um, it's amazing and it has it does have such a huge impact like I said I see it through the school but I know in a broader sense it's reaching the community too so um, it's a great job that's a great Thank job you, I, you know as Amy said earlier you know when she talked about the volunteers the collaboration though it's yeah. it's with the fire and I don't want to leave anybody else so I'm, I'm just saying this in summarization, you know, going from the town administrator to the board, to the finance committee, the finance director, everybody's involved somehow, some way in, in, in what we're doing. Um, so that's important. It allows us to go out and, and, you know, keep doing the outreach and keep forming partnerships. So, um, you know, again, on, on the back end of it, we appreciate it just as much because it allows us to be successful. That's great. Thank you. Just to... Uh, up on the bandwagon here. I, I think it's, uh, it, your job has evolved significantly over the last several years, and uh, your response has been terrific. And again, your advocacy, and Amy and everybody else over the years to come and sell it to us and have us buy into it, not always an easy task, and uh, it's kind of reluctant at first, and uh, it really has paid dividends. It's, it's, it's fantastic, but in addition to that, I want to uh, compliment your, your proposal here to uh, invest in your offices and first responders to uh, react appropriately and recognize that they need some help sometimes too. So mm -hmm. it's, it's important. So Thank you. Definitely. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Had uh, uh, yeah. Well no. done. Constance you lost. <laughs> you were good though. <laughs> no, Laura. <laughs>
Filperetti, right, Mike? Mr. Filperetti, no other business, right? Correct. All right. Good. Good Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Oh. <laughs> Do I have a second? Second. All right. Everyone seconded that. Adjourned one. and seconded. All those in favor, aye. Right on the spot. 12 minutes.